Hello, everyone. Today is uh, Monday, April 18. It's a significant day because uh, I think the Boston, Boston Marathon is being run today. It's actually Patriots Day. But more importantly, we have a very, very special guest, Eric Nuttall, who has been the uh, preeminent advocate of uh, Canadian oil equities. He runs the largest Canadian energy ETF. And he's done an absolutely terrific job. He's had his ups and downs, as we all all have. But he's the man we want, the era. He's the man we want to hear from. Eric, um, I just took that quote from uh, Vladimir Lenin. There are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when where decades happen. And it just seems like an awful lot is happening right now in the oil patch. And so we're very grateful that you can give us forty five minutes of your time. We have uh, a very uh, esteemed group of listeners here, probably a lot of friends that you know looking in the audience. Um, in particular, uh, Oil God and Sohave from the Canadian Oil Mafia are, are going to be co-hosts in this room. I believe you've met each of them. So, in any event, Eric, thanks for showing up. It's fantastic. I know uh, I think you had an early morning um, appearance, so you're, it's, it's good stuff. I know you're busy. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. So let's just cut to the chase. Um, you did a terrific webinar with Mike Rothman last week. I urge everyone to go back and listen to that. It's on the Nine Points website. We're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of counting oil barrels. Uh, Mike Rothman does it as, as well or better than anybody else. Both Eric and I are huge fans of Mike. I urge everyone to go listen to that webinar. Instead, we want to speak about the equities and we want to talk about Canada. So um, let's just get right into it. So, Eric, um, stocks have had an absolutely phenomenal run. Some people may feel that they've missed it. That, oh, my God, how can you tell me to buy a stock that's gone up 100%, 200%, 300%? So um, what, are you, what are your thoughts about where we are? How much upside do you think there still is? And do you think the average investor has really missed it? Eric, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, George, and hi, everybody. I, I was up at uh, 4 a.m. this morning, which was a first before I had. Uh, I haven't been up since four since uh, one of my kids was was born. So I, I'm hoping I come across as as, <laughs> as clearly as uh, one can hope for. Um, yeah. So George, that, it's a good opening question because I get asked two questions whenever I market. Like I was in Saskatoon uh, last week. Awesome reception. Uh, seeing a lot of uh, energy friends, and the questions uh, that I got from most of the audience was have I missed it? The other question I'll get is, well, how much upside is there still possibly in these names after they're up, you know, two, three, four, five thousand percent, fifteen hundred percent, et cetera. And I can always tell, you know, whether they own my fund or if they're an energy investor, depending on which question they choose to to ask. But I, I really I encourage everybody to um, appreciate just how quickly like rate of change. And you know, I, I kind of tagline dare to dream here earlier, but if you truly believe in a call, then go with it and see what names look like. And I, I am a believer that we are in an environment of, of higher oil prices, which I kind of define as, as about 100 bucks. You know, we're going to gravitate, I think, between 100 and 180 ish for the next five, six, seven years. So if you believe in that, run the numbers and see what they look like. And there are many examples where stocks are cheaper today if you believe in that. So I use strip gas, I use $100 oil, strip Forex, $10 WCS diffs. And Look at what the numbers say, and you will find that you can buy some Canadian large caps at a 2.2 2 times enterprise value cash flow. And that's I use um, 2023 year-end net debt. So that's another huge mistake that people are not making or are making is that they're not giving the full benefit of how much free cash flow and deleveraging and multiple compression is occurring. If you do that in and of itself, you'll be ahead of 99% of other energy investors. And so we're buying names where, and I, I don't want this to get too stock um, specific. I'm not really fond of the whole top pick thing, and I, I don't need to come on and pump a couple, uh, you know, micro cap stocks. Um, I would prefer, frankly, everybody just to buy, buy my fund if it's suitable for you. If you if you think uh, we've done an okay job, but I, I look at stocks where you know we bought a million shares of. I've used this example on on BNN, so I, I can use it. So Nuvista, we're a, we're a big shareholder. So I think we're the second biggest after Jim Riddell. And we bought uh, a million shares in March of 2020 at about 27 cents. We also bought a million shares at around $10.54. And I can tell you as a guy that has all the numbers that what I paid 
at 1054 was cheaper on a valuation level than what I paid at 27 cents. And so people are not are not appreciating the rate of change. They're not appreciating the amount of free cash flow, like despite my best efforts to to put out some charts. And I, I do that again, not to not to recommend stocks. I just I tr- I'm trying to clear up energy ignorance because the easiest way I can make money for my investors is not calling the oil price. It's clearing up energy ignorance because it's perverting people's sense of what true value is in long dated reserves. And it's the reason why I've got names trading at like one and a half times cash flow and they used to trade at eight. So if I can get a, a you know, a doubling in the the uh, trading multiples from a whopping 1.5 to like a whopping three, which is like a 15 percent free cash flow yield, then, you know, we can double from here. So going back to have investors missed it, we are still so early and it, it it's mind blowing to me truly that the generalist guy has been so slow, like retail gets it. And I can tell you that emphatically, because as you mentioned, like we run uh, the fund actually cracked 1.8 billion. We're just a little below that right now, but we're the biggest fund. I'm hundred percent retail. They're the best client base I could possibly have. And, you know, they get it because I could see that through funds flow, but generalists, institutions, like I'm finally having talks with institutions, which nobody ever wanted to talk to me before. And so I think there's all the evidence that the ESG investors get being pulled into this trade because they're, you know, I've said before as a fund manager, and George, you would know this, our, our weakness, like our kryptonite, is that our clients can fire us with the click of a mouse button in three nanoseconds. And the only reason they don't do that is if we're making the money or not. And so you can be as, you know, eco-woke as you want, but if your job was on the line, you're coming back to this trade. And we're seeing evidence uh, of that. And so, you know, how much, how much more upside do we see? Being general, you know, I see more than 100%. We've got names that we think we can we can squeeze at another two hundred percent because like at the at a ten dollar discount to where we trade today, I'm buying them at like thirty five percent free cash flow yields and like two and a half times cash flow and I'm getting, you know, three decades of thirty five percent dividends for free. To me, that kind of seems like a good opportunity. So by the same extension, then have people missed it? Absolutely not. You know, we are most people that I'm seeing who's on this call and it's a lot of friends on. We are burdened by having done too well. And you can trick yourself into thinking that, you know, the best is, is you know, the best is behind us, et cetera. But I, I would encourage you just to run the numbers, look at my graphs or do them yourself. Do, whatever you do, don't look at Bay Street numbers because analysts, you know, they're, they're, their focus is job preservation, not making investors money. It's laughable how low their estimates are, in my opinion, at least. And so as a guy, you know, I've got a, a, a great analyst who helps me on, on the numbers. We've got most companies modded out between 60 and 120. And I get so excited, you know, so every day that I get new money in, I just, I'm like a kid in a candy store some morning saying, I can't believe that I can buy these stocks. Why do more people not see what we see? Yeah, Eric, that's just phenomenal. It's funny listening to you talk. I mean, I know we were privileged, the three of us, we had a conference call with Peter Lynch a few months ago. And just listening to you speak, and the reason I wanted to have you speak to Peter is you, you just take a page right out of his playbook. I mean, his signature line of know what you own. I mean, it's just when I'm listening to you talk, it's just, it's just, it's as if I'm listening to, you know, if, if Peter Lynch was 40 years younger and living up in Toronto following energy <laughs> stocks, he would be Eric Nuttle. All right. Um, but, but know what you own. And I tweeted out this silly thing. I, I tweeted out from time to time. Um, it's a quote from Oscar Wilde. Nowadays, people know the, the price of everything and the value of nothing. So in a world where everyone's, you know, looking at relative strength and, you know, Twitter bro and FinTwit, and no one's doing any work. You're one of the few yeah. guys doing any work. I mean, it puts you in such a terrific uh, competitive, uh, advantageous position. I mean, uh, in your experience, you've been doing this for a while. How would you characterize what's happened to the quality of street research in your view? I mean, is it just, is oh, it, it's, it's, it sucks. It sucks so bad that it's not even worth reading in most cases. Because most analysts are afraid to make a call because if they, you know, they're terrified about being wrong and you can't blame them, right? Like it's tough, like you to go on, you know, and I know this because I've been doing, you know, BNN and CNBC and all those things and I'm wrong a lot. You know, we all are if we're, if we're tr- truthful about that. But these guys, you know, you're in print and people can say, oh, you, you twit, like what you thought this and you wrote this and the stock went down, et cetera. So most analysts are terrified about losing their job because they, they make good money. And so, you know, I saw it, this just bugs me. I'm not going to say which Canadian bank, but they, you know, they come out with a piece, you know, we're upgrading, oh, you see 15% upside. And then you're like, okay, that's, that sounds lower than what I have. So let's check their commodity price forecast. They weren't even using strip. They were using like strip minus 15 bucks. 
And the explanation was, quote, to be conservative, end quote. And so the, the, their focus clearly is not making money. Because if I did that, like if I followed that logic in 2020, I'd be like driving a bus. I wouldn't be doing this. Like the right. only way you can make money as an investor is like make a call, research it, do your best. Right. If you're yeah, wrong, yeah. try to admit that as early as you can. But yeah, yeah research is... Yeah, exactly. Know what you're on. I have to ask you, Eric, did you, are you familiar with, did you ever have the pleasure of meeting Don Cox? Don Cox? I heard him speak. I'd never met him personally. Yeah, so I, Don I, Cox, I he's a, he, he, we're going to have him in this room. I think you would really enjoy him. He, he was, you remind me of him a little bit as well. I remember in the early OOs, he made a big commodity call when China was industrializing and was going around talking about buying copper and everything else. And he went and made a presentation to the to the to the manager of a major mining house in London. And after his whole presentation, the CEO said, "Mr. Cox, you're all wrong. Uh, I've been in this business my entire life, and let me just tell you, like you know, what you're saying is going to happen. It can't possibly happen." And he coined a wonderful phrase. I'm going to say it twice. I'll say it slowly, and I'll say it twice. And the, and the reason I'm mentioning this. It probably kind of reminds me a little bit of maybe some of the analysts who've gotten beaten up so badly, you know, over, over the last decade. And Don Cox's line went something like this. <clears throat> Those who know it the best love it the least because they've lost the most. Again, <laughs> those who know it the best love it the least because they've lost the most. And I can imagine like you're a management team, you know, flat as the new up. So now you get into the scenario where you're pinching yourself like, oh, my God, this can't possibly be happening. But it's happening. I mean, so, I mean, Eric, let me ask you this. How how is your thinking over, over the last few months? How has your attitude changed toward to, 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 towards the energy stocks? I would say I'm more bullish now because I can buy stocks with more confidence because it's no longer based upon a forecast. It's based upon a reality with a discount baked into it. Um, so I, I, I feel quite good, you know, ch chatting with teams to just go back to a point that you made. Nobody can believe like the, the, the CFOs are all checking their bank accounts on a weekly basis. And they can't believe how much free cash flow is piling in. Like this, this sector is debt free next year. Like if you, if you reflect just on that one point, and that's using hundred dollar oil, which I think is conservative, like this sector, which was on its, you know, it's ass two years ago debt free in two years. And so <laughs> that excites me because, you know, the average, and I reference Peters, I, I didn't want to crap all over Bay Street too much here. So there are guys that do good work, like Peters I like, because they tend to be ultra conservative. So if I want my worst case scenario, I talk to them because I've, I've got, you know, a big margin of, of safety built in. So they would say the average Canadian company is 15 years of state filed inventory. And so I, I, I think about that. And so if you're a debt free company, you've got 15 years, I say rule of thumb is 10 or under, you need to add 10 over, you're good. So you've got 15 years of inventory. You don't have to do M&A. You're trading on average the Canadian, average Canadian companies trading at a 29% free cash yield at $100 oil. So you don't have to pay down debt. You don't have to do M&A. But the cash is piling in every single day. And so like, what do you do with that? There's only two things. You give it back to your shareholders in the form of a dividend. Or you say, my stock is so stupidly cheap. I'm going to go buy it. If you don't want it, you know, Jim Smith, who thinks we're all driving electric cars in three years, I'll buy it myself because it, it represents tremendous value. And I don't, I can't, so if, as long as I'm right on the call for oil next year and going forward, I can't see another outcome than, you know, we're in an era, I've, I've said, you know, go, the golden era of free cash flows and these companies will have no choice but to give it back to us. Fantastic. All right. So let's move on here. Um, we have a, two uh, of our of good friends of the room, ranking senior members. Canadian oil mafia. We have oil guard and so hey, so oil guard, I want to yield the floor to you. Uh, and you have some questions for uh, Eric. Go ahead, oil guard. The floor is yours. Thank you, George. All hail, Eric. Great job. Congratulations for having the top energy fund on the planet Earth. I mean, I don't know how many times you dreamed of somebody saying that. For those of you <laughs> new to the room, uh, please look up Eric Nuttall's fund, the Nine Point Energy Partners. He's also come out with an income fund for some of you with grayer hair. George, I'm not talking about you. Um, but, you know, he can hit you, up, you know, obviously this free cash flow in the form of an income. He can also get you some equity lift uh, with respect to the fund itself because we're not going to be talking about stocks. Eric, I'm going to be talking to you today about the hottest topic, obviously a sad topic in the world with respect to Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine and Russia have highlighted something that we all knew. You know, we had an energy crisis, as you know, going into, the, obviously, this conflict. What has the conflict done for you with respect to how you think of the changing oil and gas landscape? 
Yeah, so I'm going to say for one, it hasn't helped energy stocks because it perverts people's minds in terms of, you know, why is oil going up? Oh, it's a geopolitical event. You know, when peace breaks out, the oil price is going to crash 15 bucks. And so trying to entice the generalist guy back into the sector, it has not been helpful. Where I, I think, and you can kind of see governments going there, it, it seemed logical. Look, um, the, a barrel of Russian energy is no longer politically palatable because it's quite obvious that they're weaponizing its revenue. Like that's the biggest no-brainer all time. And so my fear about you know sanctions easing the next day, and you know what I, I it's all short-termism. What I think is going to happen more medium to long-term is the starvation of capital and the starvation of technical services because I don't know how a global super major justifies to their board the amount of political risk being taken on by going into country in an environment where companies are, you know, they stopped investing, God, seven, seven years ago, you know, peaked in 2014, it's down half since then. And so are you, you let's say you're whatever, company XYZ, you just took a $5 billion write down. Are you going to go running back into country the very next day once, you know, Russia start, stops running over raped women with tanks? Like my suggestion would be no. And so I, I don't think people have gone there yet. People don't understand the long-term consequences. Everyone's just saying, oh, China and India will buy the embargo, embargo barrels. There's no subsidy, et cetera. But I think there's a longer-term impact when you're talking about the second largest net exporter in this planet in a world where, again, I think, you know, OPEC's spare capacity exhaustion is looming. U.S. shale hyper growth is over. Global super majors aren't growing, et cetera. Like, it's just, it's additive to the bull market. But I, I just, I don't feel like people are going there yet. Thank you for that. And just to follow up, I mean, what we're seeing, and, and you're seeing this in other commodities as well, is just incredible amounts of inflation. And this inflation is obviously, you know, something that I'm sure you keep an eye on because, you know, do we have to be worried about a recession in respect to, you know, what happens if there is no supply coming online and, and oil prices do continue up to 180, 200? Have you done any of the work or can you kind of talk to us about sort of the fear that you may have that, if commodities run because obviously, you know, they continue to drain the SPR as a, yeah. as a measure of offense. I mean, you see where I'm going with this. Yeah. So the SPR takes us to the midterms, like shocking, you know, the, the timing kind of lines up. Uh, will a recession impact global oil demand growth? Absolutely. You know, I was just less so than in previous cycles, but of course it's going to impact. But you know, like that's always been in the back of mind. That's where we're headed. You know, you have to kill the economy with higher energy prices to restore balance. Because you can't keep drawing, and I'm going to have to redo all of my charts, which is really annoying here. You know, my big inventory charts to, for the SPR releases, but you you just can't keep drawing forever. You know, eventually the market wakes up to my God, we're like we're in an energy supply crisis, and so that was always kind of the conclusion. But it's it's impacting growth, not impacting absolute. Like you know, periods of absolute negative demand growth is very rare. Um, and so I, I don't, I'm not terrified that the whole thesis goes out the window if the, if the, if the world goes into a recession. It, it, we're, we're cr so profoundly undersupplied and increasingly so going forward that I think we've got a very big margin uh, of error. Like historically, it's, it's for every one point of negative GDP, you impact oil demand by 0.3, roughly speaking. And so, you know, in a market that pre SPR, you're undersupplied by one and a half to two. I think that was going to be getting worse. You've got OPEC's capacity exhaustion in four to six months. There's, we've got a lot of margin built into these the, the, tr the, the oil price itself. And then when I look at, well, stocks are clearly not discounting the current price. So I, 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 I believe at least that we have uh, a lot of margin of safety. Yeah, thank you for that, Eric. And before I see to Sohaib, um, you know, you also mentioned that you know, many of these companies that you, you we're interested in here, you know, have two years of sort of debt on average remaining. So, you know, assuming this recession was to come in a few years, I mean, these companies, I, I'd argue, are going to be in the best position to weather them than any time in history. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's actually less than that. So debt on, on average, I would have about six months of debt, of free cash flow. Um, right now, the average, and guys have seen this chart, it's the best chart I've ever made. Because it is, if you don't understand how profoundly mispriced energy stocks are, when you see this graph, you never will. It, it measures how many years of free cash flow at $100 oil would it take for a company to privatize and become debt-free, not because I think I'm out of a job in you know four years because everyone's going to privatize, but it just it, it shows how companies can force the re-rating by being aggressive buyers. And so right now, the average Canadian company can privatize and become debt-free with 3.3 years of free cash flow. And so, yeah, you think about, you know, 
get, we know cost structures are low. They're never returning to the, you know, the prior uh, bull markets where Carson pointed, you know, the private bar kind of thing. Like we're, ne we're never going back there. Investors, owners, me, we will not allow that. And so you've got debt-free entities with, with very, very skinny mar um, cost structures um, you know, the dollar uh, linkage is broken down here. So, you know, we would have been a par in previous cycles. Now we're at, uh, you know, 80-ish cents. So that's another uh, tailwind for us as well. Thank you for that, Eric. George, over to you. Thank you. So, Eric, some more questions. I know we've got another 20 minutes or so. So why Canadian names? I mean, most of the people in this room are probably from the United States, um, just because we're bigger, huh? but why Canadian names as opposed to, you know, just going and buying the XOP or Devon or Diamondback or whatever? Why should one be looking at Canadian names in particular? Yeah, a lot of it comes down to valuation. It comes down to rate of change. And so like Canada, we've, we've been like the, uh, what's the term, the redheaded stepchild, you know, for, for a long time, right? We've been out of pipe. We've got, you know, a government, which I, I need to, in all my public commentary, I need to remain as apolitical as, as possible. So I'll just say we have a government that is not the biggest champion of our sector. So we're out of pipe, big discounts. Um, you know, you've got the Trudeau government. Um, and so our, we were penalized. Valuation-wise, pre-Ukraine-Russia, we were trading pretty damn close to Russian EMP stocks. And so I, I would tell people, I'm like, well, like I, I know we've got a government, you know, that's not the biggest champions here, but we shouldn't be trading at the same political risk discount as Russian EMPs. And then I look at valuations. And so, you know, when I look at what I'm buying without getting names specific, I'm buying names at 1.5 times enterprise value to cash flow. And I think, you know, they're going to re-rate to four to six and I've got 150, 200% upside. I look at a, Dev, a Devon, which is a name we own in um, our income fund. Uh, it would be trading at $100 royals, trading at 4.1 times. So let's say it's, it's almost three times more expensive. If it re-rates to seven, you know, we're squeezing out 70% upside. You know, we own that because we're getting a variable dividend of, we think, 9.9% .9 at $100 oil, and then we're writing calls on it where we're, we're, we're making over 30% annualized on that. So it's like if we can keep doing that, it's 40% cash on cash. It, it works for income. My goal is to maximize upside returns based upon a view that we are in a structural bull market. Everyone is energy ignorant. Most people, other than people <laughs> listening here, most people are absolutely clueless. They're not here yet. They will be one day because the performance is going to drag them. And so I want to make my money from that meaningful re-rate when a stock goes from trading at one and a half to you know four times. They go from trading at a 35% a, a free cash yield to 15. You know, ooh, what are we rating? Well, hey, stocks Eric, are more than a double. Eric, Eric I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know what's so funny? Listening to you talk, it takes me back to my early years when I was a young buck at Fidelity. And we started investing in Spanish stocks for the first time. This was, I was Peter Lynch's uh, foreign stock jock. And Spain was coming out of a period where um, you know, it, was, it was only you know, a few years earlier, a decade or two earlier, where Franco had been in charge of Spain. It was just a horrible place. And you couldn't find any research on Spanish stocks. I would joke with people tongue-in-cheek that my edge was I could find Spain on the map of Europe. But at any rate, um, I, uh, a Spanish broker came to visit our offices in Boston. And it was a fellow who I recognized from uh, the Wharton School where I, where I took my MBA. And he comes in. He starts pitching us these stocks. Utility stocks. The phone company. Telefonica. I mean, we're not talking about some highfalutin you know, tech stock. We're talking about very basic things, ut electric utilities and the phone company. And these things were like on PEs of two. And I looked at him, and I was like, wait a second. Is this a scam? Like, what are you talking about? And, and I, I kidded him. I said, I said Borja, you'd have a much better chance of getting getting us to buy these names if you told me they were on four times earnings instead of two times earnings. <laughs> <laughs> this is, like, too good to be true. And so, like, I mean, do you ever pinch yourself, Eric, that, like, this could – that this could possibly be happening? Yes, I do. Because I can, I can tell you, like, you know, it goes back to an earlier, an earlier question. You know, we all know how tough it's been. We don't have to, you know, to re redo that conversation. It's, you know, been a gamer survivor. It's, it's myself and I, I think in Canada, it's really myself and one guy. So you got two people left. And so this market is so incredibly inefficient. And that's the reason why you can find these opportunities because no one is doing the work. Like I'm a, I'm a shareholder in many companies. And it's me, like it's me and retail. There, there's no one left. Well, it's not because, you know, retail and me are, are, are dumb, I don't think. It's because we're the only ones looking 
for the opportunity. But people are looking now. Like I can I can see it through. Yep. You know, all it takes is one buyer, and a stock jams up eight or nine percent in small. Yeah, and you, you, you know, Eric, I'm just shaking my head. I'm marveling at listening to you talk. It's just you and retail. And then if you go on Bloomberg and you look at the stocks people typically own here in the states with index portfolios, and you take a name like Amazon. I think there's 58 recommendations. It's like 57 buys in one hold. I mean, where do you think you can gain an edge? It's not in. It's not in looking at Amazon. I mean, this is like it's rather fortuitous. I suppose it's going back to the Don Cox line. It's only because you had to walk through the desert where you were subjected to horrendous time that this opportunity has uh, has presented itself. Otherwise, totally. otherwise it wouldn't be possible. All right, let's move on a little bit more to some of the Canadian details. So. Um, we're not going to talk about the geopolitical risk from a Russia Ukrainian standpoint. And I see Oliver Parsons who works with uh, Mike Rothman's in the audience. If Oliver would like to come up, it'd be great. Maybe he wants to ask you a question, but you, Mike and yourself did a great job of going over that last week. What I'd like to, to will be really useful though. I think maybe a little bit more nuanced. Could you speak to the Canada specific risks and opportunities, be it the exchange rate, be it piping, be a tax regime, you know, excess yeah. windfall, excess profits tax. Could you give us some of the inside baseball Canadian minutia, which most of us would not be familiar with, please? Thank you. Sure. So the backdrop is, you know, in, investors don't want growth. Okay. And that's not going to change. Like, when would I stop leaning on my management teams and say, okay, boys, like, let's, let's go grow. The world needs our barrels. Forget about buybacks. You know, okay, maybe not so much of a special dividend, et cetera. I think stocks have to double from here. And so, until that happens, I don't see a call on meaningful growth from our basin. And yet, when you look at the pipeline build out, you know, TMX, which all Canadians um, own, we had to nationalize it basically to get it across the, the finish line. You know, you're looking at, uh, I'm going to say 2000, late 2023, I'll, I'll see. You know, it's a little behind, 20, late 23 to early 2024. Um, at that point, I think we're at, you know, $10 to $8 WCS differentials. And until meaningful volume growth, where we will never see another greenfield oil sand project sanctioned ever again, it'll be brownfield expansion, and that'll, that'll you know, probably just offset um, basin-wide declines. We're long pipe. From a government perspective, it's the cards are on the table, right? Like we've got a carbon tax; it's going up. They're not going to give credit to those that are injecting CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, which is a completely missed opportunity, but they can't be seen as supporting, you know, big oil, et cetera. Um, pathways to net zero 2050, the billions of dollars being sent by industry, it negates free cash flow by like a whopping 1% per year. It's a rounding error when, when I can say that, you know, I, I said on CNBC, so I can say like Synovus, by our math is trading at a 30% free cash flow yield. So, you know, where they go from 30 to 20, I don't know, my God, it's, you know, stocks to sell. So, Profit windfall tax, I was seeing that on Twitter a lot. Like we, we use consultants who have, um, you know, inroads into the federal government to try to detect if there was a tone change. My, my best take is the current prime minister, let's just assume we're under liberal rule. The current prime minister will not be in that seat for more than a year or so. And there, you've got two incumbents. Um, there, one is a more down the, I have to be very careful how I, use this term they're more devout to esg call than another another would be more re practical so she may not be the biggest advocate for the sector but she recognizes that to dig our, our country out of the fiscal hole that we're in we need all cylinders of the economy firing so i, I don't see a windfall profit tax like we, we're doing that to the banks just for one year is purely like they made it up literally on the campaign trail and it's a one and done um so maybe you get that but I'm not picking up any any vibes from from the, the 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 people that we use. So you know, pipeline risk, egress. I don't see an issue. Government, you know, they're never going to be the biggest advocate. The current government, but I don't see them doing anything really dumb. Um, for FX, I'm, that's going above my ski uh, over my skis. I can't comment on yeah. you know whether we're going to go back to par. And just to go back further on a point you raised specifically with respect to reserves and depletion rates uh how do the canadian names uh, stack up say relative to their oh, yeah. US counterparts okay thank you I, this is sleep deprivation I, i'm circling back to why canada okay so you think about okay what do global and energy investors want they do not want growth that's obviously like clear they want return of capital and so what what allows that you it's obviously decline rates and reserve life index you know because if, if, if you've got a shared rli 
you got to go do something with your free cash flow on M&A. You can't return it. And if you've got too high of a decline rate, like the shale codes in some cases, then you're on the treadmill and it, it negates your free cash flow. So in Canada, like you, you think about every single box an energy investor wants, like low base decline rates, um, you know, lo- relatively good capital efficiencies. You know, a, a couple of weeks ago, we were selling oil in Canadian dollars at its highest level, not in the for the year, but in history. We've got a lean cost structure. And so you think about it, like these these companies are just gushing free cash flow because of all of those attributes, you know, lean cost structure, high revenue, low corporate decline, long RLI. So I, I just like, you know, George and I always said, OK, we're not going to get company specific. So I think about what do I want to own today? Like the biggest opportunity right now to an energy investor is buying long dated reserves because the average guy is I use the term energy ignorant because that's the play way to put it. And they don't, they're not putting any value on long dated reserves because they think we won't be using the stuff. And I think everybody listening is pragmatic enough to know that we'll be using oil for the rest of our lifetimes. And so I'm, I'm buying barrels for nothing. If I could really boil it down, that's what I'm getting. And because of how profoundly mispriced these stocks are, there are cases, you know, Sonovas, I could say, because I used on CNBC, there are other smaller guys where they've got 35 years of reserves and I'm paying three times. And it's trading at a free cash yield of 38%. So my, I'm kind of simple. Like I'm just math and logic. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm getting 32 years of 38% free cash flow yield. And they'll be debt free by the end of 2023. This is one of, one of the most indebted companies in Canada. And they'll, be, they'll have no debt by the end of 2023 at $100 oil. Like, so, how so, can so, you, so, yeah, how so, can so, you yeah, not yeah, like that? Yeah, Eric, that, that, that's, that's to know this. Um, I know we don't want to get too specific. And for again. Uh, I have no commercial relationship with, with Eric. I just hang on his every word because he's the smartest Canadian oil guy I've met. For those of you that aren't, that don't follow his work, you can go on the Nine Points um, website. He's very transparent. He's got all his holdings up there. He's got his, his 10 biggest holdings. So and, and he writes extremely well, uh, not just on the website, but you go in the Financial Post and you can see him on BNN and everything else. But Eric, I know we want to get too specific. You mentioned uh, uh, Sonovas just as a representative example. Is there maybe one other name that, that, that you'd like to mention? Or would you rather not? Well, okay. So people that can read between the lines, that was Meg that I was talking about um, okay. as well. Meg. So it's, it's all kind of the same theme, right? I can We can go Got to it. the Montney and you can see top top 10. So I would own a couple of Montney guys where they think they've got tier one stay flat inventory of 20 years and it's trading at a 25% free cash yield. And I'm only paying for three of those. So 17 years, a 25% free cash load for free. Like that's where my mind is at right now and you can you can make the argument even more clearly for gas because if you think gas it can be the bridge fuel etc lng lng canada like um phase two sounds like it's coming which is going to be really great for uh for the gas guys and so you can even more like if you're not quite on board with the multi-year market thesis for oil etc and you know we're driving the cars then at least you can get behind gas because without gas we're really screwed like we yeah we're... yeah i was gonna ask you on that eric with, with, with the recent uh Rising, particularly the net gas price. Uh, how I know in the past, I remember from some of your uh, appearances last year, you were more oil focused. But how are you thinking about preference for oil, oil, oily stocks versus gassy stocks, given what's happened to to, to the recent rise in the net gas prices? Has your cha- has your thinking changed at all? Not much. No, I can't. It's hard to justify truly. Like I'm staring at seven seventy seven. You know, strip of seven fifty three for the rest of this year. Like it, it's unbelievable. I own a lot of gas because my guys that produce oil have gas at the same time. Um, so I'm getting that indirect benefit. But I, you know, we can talk about global LNG. We can talk about US LNG. We can talk about, you know, de- uh, you know supply not growing as much as we would have thought this year in US domestic. Uh, the knock-on effects. We can talk about demand, you know, industrial, et cetera. But I, I just, it still comes down to if we have a, a colder than average summer, that's, that gas price is going to get torched. Yeah, um, 100%. It, this, this is not a global commodity just yet. So I just hundred percent. It, it, it feels like someone's getting now taken out to the woodshed right now. Um, so I, I don't want to use the current price, you know, in my in my decision making. Where oil, I can have a hell of a lot more confidence that you know hundred dollars is a reasonable reasonable level to use, and I've got a lot more margin of safety. Hundred percent. We have a very special uh, questioner for you, Eric. Uh, our good mutual friend Oliver Parsons is in the house. Uh, for those of you that don't know him, he works with Mike Rothman. And Oliver, welcome. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, but um, if you have a question or two for Eric, we'd love to hear from you. The stage is yours, Oliver. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, George, Eric. Um, good job, man, holding in there, staying strong. So, I mean, what, what you're doing for the industry is great. And my, I guess my question is, from, from where you sit, um, your perspective in terms of, and, and this is a discussion we've had with, with clients, um, really getting the generalist focus money into the space. Um, that, that's kind of been the, the biggest trick. Obviously, perception has been changing dramatically. We're seeing reweighting in the various indices. So as we've said, they're kind of getting kicked, pulled into the industry, kicking and screaming, whether they like it or not. So did you kind of see, um, you know, in terms of capital flow, capital raising, the sentiment from from your investors are we are we kind of turning the tide there and kind of how do you quantify that yeah it's it's a slow grind and it, it's more um qualifiable than quantifiable and so it's when i get um you know I've, I, I i chat with uh, a really good energy trader in one of the banks uh, frequently throughout the day you'll have good conversations where you know the, the tidbit last week was there's some european esg funds that are trying to get energy into their mandate um, because they're saying, well, you know, we got to displace Russian barrels. It's the, it's the right thing to do for, you know, S and G, I guess. And so, you know, why are they doing that? It's performance, right? It's, it's killing them not to have energy exposure. Uh, I'll, I've got inbounds from endowments funds from, from us universities where they, they, they actually, and kudos to them, they see, the opportunity in buying long dated reserves and you know they've they've heard of my name when it comes to Canada, et cetera. And so it's just it's it's all at the margin. I think the 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 geopolitical conflict was not helpful. And this is as an investor speaking, we can all we all pray for, for peace, of course. But that 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 event was not helpful for bringing back generalist money because the average guy is gonna, you know, read the headline and say, well geez, when peace breaks out, we get uh, you know sanctions end and price of oil crashes and you know, I'm going to look dumb. You know, here I've been out of the trade for 10 years. I just deploy money and then a week later I get my face ripped off just like the before, right? There's so much hurt. There's so much scar tissue. But that's really the opportunity if, if you can have thick enough skin and forget those past, you know, years of, of, of tears. There's, there's just generational wealth to be made here. So it's all at the margin. Um, you know, you're not, I'm never going to be able to say with 100%, oh, yeah, it's just like a herd of elephants charging through the keyhole kind of thing. I've used that before. But I, I do feel like the ESG narrative around oil and gas for sure is changing. And that's that's really exciting because there is tremendous amounts of latent buying power once those people reach that tipping point. That's fantastic. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, I have one more question and I want Sohaib uh, to weigh in. So uh, the, the question was asked just a minute ago about how are attitudes changing amongst the investor base? I'd like to ask the question, how are attitudes changing amongst the management teams you know six months ago uh they were probably just glad they they got out of jail and they're alive <laughs> but 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 have have you know budgets get reset periodically etc cetera, etc cetera. but how are the attitudes of management teams changing now where we're seeing the oil prices being sustained was, you know it was 70 bucks last fall now it's not 70 bucks it's 100 110 bucks oh by the way i know you know with interest today's the day where the wti price has blown through the pre uh, the SPR price just before Biden announced uh, the, <laughs> the SPR release. So so, yeah. so 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 now, Joe, what are you going to do? Okay, but but I digress. So anyway, Eric, how would you? Are, are the management teams still got their head down, or some of them starting to get a yeah. little more aggressive? Well, well no. how are your conversations with the management teams, Eric? Yeah, we're we're not. They're better. They're happier conversations. You know, everybody's got a bounce in their step, but the the pain the pain was so so bad in two thousand and twenty. That we're not over it. You know, most guys want to have either low to no debt. In fact, all everybody wants to have low to no debt because the banks were such bad actors. You talk about you know, share buybacks, how do you div- you know, determine what intrinsic value is? When y'all hear, well, you know, we only use sixty dollar oil, or we want to have a debt to cash flow of less than one times at forty five dollar oil, and people are not being aggressive. You know, I I, I kind of push the envelope. I think people kind of know that. But, you know, I, I want everybody to be doing 20% uh, share buybacks, you know, do specials and stuff. I want 75% of free cash that going back to my unit holders in the form of buybacks. And I just, I think you could get an almost overnight re-rating if everybody adopted that so long as, you know, the balance sheet allows, etc. But they, we're not there yet. You know, I think I've been successful. And, um, you know, many people have had this conversation. So it's not just been a one-man campaign. But I think the, the model going forward at a minimum is 50% of free cash flow beginning in Q1, going back to to shareholders. And for those who, 
you know, for anybody that I've done a presentation to, and you see, you know, screen, screen shares of some models, like fifty percent of free cash load, a hundred dollar oil. Well, yeah, we can do the math. Actually, it's you know, it's a fifteen percent of returns because the average free cash yield is twenty nine percent in Canada. So imagine fifteen percent, and that's going higher. It should once they become debt free. That's fifteen percent. That's like a ten buyback and a five dividend. Like it's it's glorious. So you know, people are still are suffering from PTSD. Uh, the pain is deep. They're feeling better, but they, the, I think they can't believe it. That's the best way I describe it. They cannot yeah. believe how yep. much cash they are making, and they're worried about being disappointed because they've been disappointed over and over and over again. Eric, that's so wonderful. I, I, we're hoping to get Don Cox in here in the next couple of weeks. He's, he's retired, but I'd love for you to, to join us uh, when, when Don comes on because, yeah, again, be it's the same story. He, it's, those who know it the best love it the least because they've lost the most it's the muscle memory. All right, we only have a couple minutes left here uh, with you, Eric, and then we'll continue the room after you leave. But we, we've spoken about the Canadian oil mafia, the Canadian, Canadian energy mafia, and you really have been changing lives. And it's, it's not just – forget about people's bank accounts. It's not the point. It's the energy ignorance and the education. And so to that end, we have the sort of uh, honorary uh, commander in chief, Sohaib, who I believe is a friend of yours you've met before. Yeah, and so, yeah, so Sohaib would like to have a few words. Sohaib, the floor is yours. You bet. So please unmic yourself. Yeah, just 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 to wrap up the room here, and you know we've gotten a chance to go over the specifics. I think maybe just uh, we've shared our appreciation with you countless times before, being a tireless advocate uh, uh, of the sector, and we've got something coming in the way in the mail for you here. But uh, just you know, you, you've talked about the scar tissue in the sector with management be, uh, teams, you know, moderating their excitement. Uh, you know, if you could talk a little bit about yourself, and you know, it's just been the longest bear market in, in, in history and, you know, what it took to, to survive. I mean, it's a testament that, you know, it's, you, you know, you're only one, you know, there's only two guys left and right to, to the last man standing uh, lays the spoils of war. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you could just talk about what it took uh, to be one of two uh, and, and, and how to be, you know, re relentless despite, uh, you know, uh, what, what the situation's been like for, for the past eight, 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 eight seven, eight years, um, pass it off to you, Eric. Yeah, it was it was obviously challenging <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, you know, when you when you're the the supposed face of a sector and the sector's on its ass, and uh, you're just going through history like it's a history lesson. It's just be, things have never no one has experienced this, so there's no compass that I can use, and all I can have is is faith that I'm going to get through it, and trust that I'm a smart enough guy to figure it out. And you know, you're you're praying that your clients stay with you because if you get redeemed to death, like you're done. Um, in a sector specialist, I've got you know three young young kids, and they they depend on me, etc. But I, I just had the the belief that this too shall pass. Um, that's not to, meant to be a religious or whatever. It's just having just deciding to have faith that I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to make my clients whole, and I'm going to do better than that. And I like I've always wanted every single unit holder that has ever invested a penny with me. I want them to have done better than the S and P 500. And so. You know, we're on, on the path to, to achieving that um, at some point. And so yeah, I don't, I, I, we've had a kind of a similar combo before. Like it's just, it's deciding that you're going to be tough enough to get through it. I've had enough events in my life that it's, you know, it's strengthened me. And um, that's kind of it. It's, you just trust, trust yourself, trust logic, trust math. You don't buy into fear because my God, that was the, that was the biggest challenge I would say in 2020. It's all these numbskulls that are talking about, you know, the new normal and we're never going to be doing this. We're never going to be doing that. And it just there was the, the pile on was just unbelievable. So it's just I've said before, you know, like as an investor and I do just, you know, George talks to the Peter Lynch's of the world. Like, who am I to give any advice? But I just think you, you got to figure out what matters. The rest is noise. Tune it out because those are what the donkeys listen to. And it's going to take you off your path to making money for your unit holders. Just focus on what matters. See if there's trend change. See if you're wrong. If you are admit a mistake and move on and make the money back. Um, right. That's kind of it. Right. So did you have anything else you want to say? Otherwise, I'm going to wrap it up. That's pretty much it. Uh, thank you once again, Eric. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Eric, I, I, we'll close it here. I, I can't thank you enough. And by the way, one, one last comment I want to make. It's kind of hilarious. The, 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 <laughs> the comparison, the contrast couldn't be greater. Um, listening to you talk uh, reminds me of the adage again of, you know, one of the hardest things to do in a bull market, I can't remember who, who, where this quote comes from. I didn't make it up. One of the hardest things to do in a bull market is to stay invested. So that's Eric Nuttall, and that's being an <laughs> But at the same time, simultaneously, mic drop, here it comes, wait for it. 
One of the hardest things to do in a bear market is is to stay out. In other words, the siren calls beckon of all the Kathy Woods rubbish and all that stuff that's, you know, <laughs> going from the upper left to the lower right. It's, you know, to steal a line from Charles Dickens, a tale of two cities. No, this is a tale of two markets. Okay, so this is taking on biblical uh, proportions. You know, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. I got to be careful here what I say, because Kathy Wood, I think, is actually religious. But in any event, um, I'm long Eric Nuttall, short, short Kathy Wood. So, Eric, I <laughs> can't thank you, thank you enough. Hopefully you'll come back and do this again. We really learned a lot. This is absolutely awesome. So, Eric, you're, you're, you're done. We're throwing you out. You got to go play with your kids. I, I get it. The rest of us are going to sit here and just sort of uh, uh, bask in the glow of your comments. So thank you very much, Eric. You bet. And I, I thank everybody for their uh, camaraderie. Twitter is a special thing for all, all of us to be able to come together and swap swap stories and ideas and such. So I thank everybody that uh, that contributes. I get stuff out uh, of value every single day. So take care, everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. All right. So the one Eric Nuttle, my God, he, you know, he just keep it simple, stupid. I mean, just do the work. And there's just so many, you see me going on my rants on Twitter about the posers and the fakers and, you know, all those momentum guys and they're buying it for one reason and something for one reason only because it's going up. I mean, do the freaking work. Eric does the work. So uh, oil God, do you have any, uh, th- or so have any thoughts uh, or Oliver, uh, any thoughts about um, what Eric had to say? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to start by congratulating you, George. Um, to have somebody in the room like Eric Nuttall, you know, you've had Quantumstone Analytics that we're all obviously huge fans of. You've had some fantastic people uh, talk to us about markets and whatnot. But, you know, Eric, Eric hits special for lots of the, you know, the Canadians and the North Americans in the room because – you know, this was a trade that we didn't believe in for hype. We actually believed in for fundamentals. And, you know, I appreciated Sohei asking him with respect to the mental energy it took to stay the course and the faith that obviously Eric will, you know, kind of respond with. But for the rest of us in the room, you know, you've got to remember that oil is the second most used commodity on the planet Earth next to water. Right. And so there's two there's two energy managers, arguably remaining left in Canada. I'm going to say two and a half, maybe two point seven five, because if you don't know Shabam, you just wait for it. And I will say that you've got, you know, a war. You've got wars happening for centuries. You've got armaments deals. You have border. You've got borders written up all on the back of this commodity. And so for all of us to all of a sudden just think, and I know none of us in the room are like this, but for us to listen to the naysayers, as as Eric was calling them politely from 2020, this new world order, we're never going to be able to do this, we're never going to be able to do that. It's just absolute bullshit, right? And we all focus on the electric vehicle because it seems to be the biggest, shiniest object out there. But we can't even figure out a way to charge our cell phones without the use of fossil fuels, right? And I'm going to implore you to think think how long this is likely going to stay the case. And so for me, George, this was very inspirational. Uh, you know me personally, you know I'm, I'm what we call balls deep in this trade. Uh, and I still incredibly feel like I don't own enough, but that's always a good thing. It's like being at a good restaurant and wanting another bite. Back that's over awesome. to you. That's awesome. By the way, um, and so hey, I just sent you a direct message. If you could please throw that tweet up on the nest. Now here comes the squeeze. Uh, I can't. I'm not a co-host, so I can't. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Let me make you a co-host. Hold on one second here. You're going to teach me how to do this someday. Um, so is is Oil Guide so graciously mentioned? We've had a lot of these fantastic rooms. You know, people like Eric Nuttall and Michael Belkin and Stan Weinstein and Tom Thornton. And just go look. They're all up on our YouTube page now. At any rate, we do this all for free. Um, but... Uh, you know, there's no personal benefit here. I think if you believe you've gotten value from these rooms, um, would you please pay forward and give generously to World Central Kitchens? They are literally doing God's work. Uh, they're in the Ukraine. Many other organizations can't go in there because of the danger. I mean, the organization that should remain named, they, they got bombed on. And I think, talking to my colleague Carol Strone, I think the WCK actually got hit. These people are literally taking their life into their own hands. They're, they're three and a half million refugees in the Ukraine. They're, I think, providing 300,000 hot meals a day. And so we have first, first, we, we, we have first world high, uh, you know, high class problems here. 
trying to maintain or, 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 or increase our, our wealth. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you got a few bucks, it makes it easy for you. So, I think, so uh, I think threw it up in the nest. Um, there's a link there to give to world central kitchen. I don't think it's much of an ask I and mean, think about it, you know, for, for those that are fortunate, I mean, if you're just a kid and you only can afford 10 bucks, that's fine. But you know, if you're a high net worth guy rolling the dough with tens of millions, you know, put it, put it on the credit card for a thousand bucks. It's no big deal. I and mean, it means a lot to people who need it. So yeah, we, you know, we have a sense of community here. I'm an honorary member of the Canadian oil mafia. Um, so hey, even oil God and the others, they I've got my swag. In fact, I'm going to change my uh, picture, my profile picture on Twitter to feature, to feature the merchandise. But, you know, we're, we're all friends. We're all trying to help each other. This has been an unbelievable room to have someone like the caliber of Eric Nuttall. And we're providing access to people like Eric, which you normally would not get. And so I think we're very fortunate. I'm fortunate because I've been around for a while. I've got a, got a pretty big, you know, Rolodex or whatever you call it, Microsoft contacts list. So please, if you got any value from, from this session, please give generously to World Central Kitchen. Uh, Oliver, are, are you still there, Oliver? Yep, I'm yeah. here, George. Yeah. <laughs> so, Oliver, without, without giving it, telling any stories out of school, um, I believe you know Eric pretty well. I believe he's a friend of Cornerstone. Um, I'm just curious your take on what he had to say and anything from where you sit, um, you know, anything he would add. Yeah, no. I, so so I think, I mean, obviously he's, he's at a great fund, um, number one energy fund uh, last year. But I think it, it really comes down to, um, and the question I asked him is, it's really the perception. So, so again, getting the generalist money now into the space, I think the fundamentals have obviously changed dramatically. Um, now it's kind of convincing the herd so we can see more momentum picking those names up. And from a fundamental story, it was kind of a multi-pronged attack where we had to kick out the legs of, of U.S. shale, make that argument. Um, the whole ESG green narrative had to change. And the OPEC discipline, I mean, I, I remember a year and a half ago, even a year ago, everyone's like, oh, it's OPEC, they'll cheat, they'll cheat. Um, so that th those calls, really, they, they all had to kind of, the stars had to align. Um, and as we saw last year, record inventory draw. As we have seen in Q1, I mean, the IEA, they came in saying we're, we're going to have a build consensus was was calling for a build and i think we were down about um 80 80 on on the quarter so it it was a a big draw that um i don't think people were really expecting and as we head into driving season as we head into q4 of this year the the question is okay what's what's opec spare capacity and and our argument with mike rothman he's he's really been spot on for all these fundamentals so i i think we uh we always say it's supply and demand that's that's really the intersection and it's inventories so that that's what we're tracking closely and uh it's been a tough fight but eric uh eric's been you know kind of in the foxhole and uh these are these are life-changing uh, gains 100 percent. and by the way for those of you uh, who don't know uh, Cornerstone or Mike Rothman, again, I have no commercial relationship other with, with, with Cornerstone either. I've just known Mike for decades. In my opinion, he is the best, single best oil analyst on the street. Um, he's been attending OPEC uh, meetings in Vienna before many people in the room were born. I mean, he's forgotten more about energy than most of us know. And so he's a real oil, oil nerd. I say that affectionately. He counts the barrel. <laughs> he had an incredible... And we're not going to bore everybody. If anyone asks the question, Oliver will answer it. But there was this whole thing about missing oil. There was undercounting of billions of barrels of oil, which Mike was, 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 was screaming from the top of his lungs about for years. And he had a lot of tomatoes thrown at him. But just recently, a few weeks ago, the IEA came out with a massive revision um, in their oil consumption numbers. And the reason that's important is because it's telling you that actual oil demand is bigger than was previously thought. And so... You know, we already oil demand hit a new exceeded the 2019 high, uh, I believe, in the fourth quarter last year. Uh, we were hoping to get the, the whale oil queen, Ms. Woods herself, on to explain her $12 forecast. But I think she was too busy. She had some other some other engagement. But but but, you know, one thing I, I know, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, uh, Oliver, because there's a lot of proprietary work that you guys do. But I guess one high level question that maybe you could answer. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, my God, oil's gone up so much. We're going to have a recession. Um, could you speak to the extent you're comfortable talking about the oil burden model and why 
you think or Mike thinks oil can go much higher still from here? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of people, even investors in the space, they they forget 2008, they forget the uh, the previous highs, they they forget emerging markets and and really what uh, oil intensity they have. And if we use 08 as a as an example, I mean, we we saw oil going up to uh, to 147, and and it really wasn't uh, the high prices that started cracking demand. It, it was Lehman failing. It was uh, the global financial crisis. So, you know, the, the argument could have been made that oil prices were, were still set to go higher. Um, so when we look at the, uh, the environment now, we're, we're kind of in a situation where we're regulated by boom, boom and bust cycles in the, uh, in the economy. So the question at hand is like, okay, what, uh, what's going to derail the, the bear case? Um, well, you, you can have some external factor causes a recession, oil demand gets crushed. Okay, but there's also door number two, which is oil prices will keep going higher until they crack the economy. So that comes down to your question, George. Okay, what's what's the oil burden? So if we use 08 as an example, um, you know, we, we had 147, add some inflation to that, like we'll, we'll be north of that number. But um, the uh, I, I think the real question is if you bring into account inflation and, and really the supply chain issues and can production come online, like what, what is going to solve this issue? Um, and we don't see the... Uh, the supply response so so it will ultimately have to be a, a demand response I, I think which just um like i said it, it's a recession led or just the consumer gets pinched too hard and, and, and oliver isn't that the way it always works you look at all these recessions i mean the the is as, as eric was mentioning oil's all, oil demand has actually gone down i'm channeling my inner mike rothman now <laughs> i've gone enough to his presentations Actually, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm as good looking as Mike. Maybe I could pretend to be him. I have to gain some weight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, but seriously, um, as I recall, and, and, and correct me on this, Oliver, if I'm not mistaken, oil demand has only gone down like three times in the last 50 years. It was the oil prices in the early 70s, the great financial crisis and COVID. Is, isn't that correct? Something like that? Uh, yeah. And I, I think um, a lot of people, they, they just forget the emerging markets i mean you you look at you look at china um you look at the uh the non-oecd countries as a whole i mean their their demand charts are, are pretty much just straighten up to the right um so when when we look at okay what what's going to make a demand collapse if, if you look at 08 it it really wasn't the um the uh OECD story. It, it was the non-OECD that that allowed the the rebound to occur. So unless we see um, countries just really start, uh, you know, curtailing demand, but but you you have you know things that you know J curve, what, whatever fancy term you want to use, that that really says as as uh, the, these um, GDPs pick up, they they start becoming more intensive for oil use. So you know, com compare China, equate it to to us, Mexico to us, like. In the U.S., if we take that per capita number, I mean, the demand numbers are, are off the chart. So I think um, a lot of people, they they really confuse with, you know, OK, if there's there's a recession, how much will uh, will demand be impacted? And right now we're just all all metrics are just showing demand is, is still picking up. And importantly, Oliver, if I is to the bigger point, it's it's the real the delta because demand always tends, you know, in all years except three in the last 50 Demand kind of goes up at, you know, GDP minus or whatever. So when we get these big swings in prices. It always has to do with the with pretty much, it's usually the supply side, not the demand side. So the extent that the, you know, OPEC excess production capacity is being, um, is, is falling away, you know, they look at the recent months, they haven't been able to keep up with their quotas. I mean, what's the likelihood that between now and the end of the year, as we get on towards the end of the year, that the narrative is going to change, the story is going to change to, wait a second, how much excess capacity is left and are we running out of capacity? I mean, what, what's the like, and if that happens. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think that that is the exact question and that, that will become the, uh, the, the popular topic uh, to discuss as, as we head later into the year. But, but we, we see a situation where OPEC spare capacity, it, uh, it, it could be whittled down to the zero mark by, by year end, which, which sounds crazy to some, 
Um, but you know, you, if you were making a bullish call a year ago, 18 months ago, that, that was crazy as well. So I think, um, last year it was more of a demand story. Okay. When, when is demand going to recover? Um, so, so we focused on that and, and that was, that was the correct call. The missing oil, as you mentioned, I mean, demand was running much higher than anyone thought possible. Inventories were drying. Everyone was really asking why. And it was, you know, you had the IA gaming, gaming the numbers, February, February 11th and their OMR, they, they came clean. Now they have that, you know, the rift with OPEC, OPEC kicked them out as a, um, as a secondary data source. So, you know, it, it just shows like, okay, Mike, Mike was onto something. Um, and then this year we, we've really been focusing our clients more on the, uh, on the supply picture because demand is, is back now. It's like, okay, we're, who, who's going to be able to produce what are, are we going to see, Venezuela save the day that that's not happening Iran I mean you know we're on round eight of of negotiations with them so really on the margin who who can produce and it, it'll be um you know Saudi their their spare capacity IEA forever has been saying 12.5 million a day and you know that <laughs> that's a number we've we've always uh, been quite skeptical about um so our our figure is is much lower than that um so i think by year end that that spare capacity number will be tested people will start talking about it um and that that will definitely be a uh, more uh, kind of fuel to the fire here right and, and one other thing i'm gonna go on a well guide uh in your conversations with clients uh, oliver are they starting to you getting a lot more inbound people start to become more receptive or are you starting to get more inbound calls or oh yeah yeah <laughs> it's yeah. uh i had a couple of weeks ago i had a, a pm who who covered the um i think it was the uh the healthcare space called me um because they they didn't a big fund <laughs> managed a lot of money they they didn't have an energy analyst um you know so you kind of uh destroyed the industry kicked everyone out the energy funds closed and now people are playing catch up. So yeah, yeah. when you have the, uh, you know, the tech guy, the healthcare guy calling you to ask about oil, then, uh, he, you know, it's kind of game on. Um, so yeah, there, there's been a huge change in sentiment. People that we're talking to, um, you know, really what, what we're seeing the headlines, even, even on Bloomberg, Reuters, et cetera. Um, it, it's, it's kind of what we've been um, talking about for, for a while. Um, but, it took a while to catch on, and and now with Russia, et cetera, we're we're here. So I don't see see the sentiment turning quite negative. Um, so it's we're still chugging ahead. But, uh, I, I hope you'll stay on stage. That's awesome. Maybe you can work on like maybe we can double team him to get him. Yeah, because... <laughs> it'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. You know, all you have to do is listen to the replay. This will be jealous because it's like, oh shit, he'll say, I can do that. All right. All right. Oil, 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 oil God, what's up, man? I'm meeting yourself, Oil God. Yeah, thank you for that. And Oliver, great to hear you. Happy Easter to you and your family on behalf of the Canadian Oil Mafia. Great to have you <laughs> up here. Uh, a question for you is actually another element to add to the quote unquote bullish scenario for the commodity. I mean, you look at, you know, we talked about this earlier with Eric. If, if you got oil prices and inflation running hot, and then you've got all the commodities, the metals, the mines, all these, these problems of respect to the inputs to renewables isn't that not another area that would take away from the demand in oil if renewables actually don't launch to you know the way they once were thought to have launched and in sort of replace you know all the bullshit fossil fuels from this russia ukraine situation just your thoughts on that yeah well i think the whole i mean the whole narrative it, it was it was really just such a polarization in the industry and you know you you either I, I kind of say you're. I read this one article, and and you're left with this this false dilemma where you're you really have you have two options, and you're you're either pro oil and and you're awful, or or you're pro green and and you're you're great. So it uh it, the Russia and as fortunate as as it has been, um you know the the silver lining in terms of changing the perception in in the industry has has really shown that energy security is uh is something that matters energy poverty is something that matters i mean you know look look at prices nat gas prices etc um you know th these people who politicians who kind of parade around on on their soapboxes 
yelling about, uh, you know, green initiatives. It, it's not that we're anti. It's just what's what's re- realistic. And if you don't like oil, what's it going to be substituted with? So so we we kind of had this situation where every, you know, CNBC, every article, everything was just so negative about uh, about oil. And, you know, people were parading around the, the green energy. So I, I think um, as we as we look out to the future, the the whole Russia situation has really intensified the, the understanding that that we need oil. Um, but it also has the posturing from the Biden administration, the four hundred dollar gasoline cards. I mean, none of that is a is a solution to the, the supply problem. Um, so I think. I think going forward, it's it'll it'll really be be a test of people understanding that that we need fossil fuels, we we need oil, um, we can work on all the green initiatives at the same time, but that's not the solution at the moment. Hey, Eric, I got Oliver. Got to ask. I just saw a headline fly by on Twitter. Uh, it said the number of ducks, you know, drilled uncompleted wells has has fallen to an all time low. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, it, it keeps dropping. And I, I think as, uh, as Eric mentioned, um, you know, these, these managers of, of oil companies, they, they were all kind of cast into the shadows and told they were, they were the most awful people alive. Um, and now what, what's their incentive to drill? You know, that if, if they're making money, if, if they have free cash flow, they'll, they'll buy back the stock, they'll give dividends, um, you know, there's especially with with inflation and kind of the whole supply chain issues, really, the, the hurdle rate to to invest in these projects is is much higher. So I, I think when when you bring up the ducks, it's, it's just a bigger issue that, um, you know, people in the industry, if we look at last week or two weeks ago, you know, all the all the CEOs and et cetera from from the big oil firms were paraded around uh in Washington DC and you know the, there was we we want to have a windfall tax on on their profits so so all of that it it just really hurts any um motivation in in the industry so your comment about ducks is it's just bigger picture yeah what's really what what's the point of of drilling if um if we're the bad guys anyway unreal let's move on get some other folks in the game hey uh, we'll do duff and then warren what's up duff Hey, nice to meet you, George. Uh, hello to all the other Canadian oil mafia, the people that I see in there. I had the uh, I had the pleasure of meeting here just a few nights ago on uh, on uh, Wednesday night here in Saskatoon. Had a chance to talk to him for a little bit. Uh, I've had a chance to talk to him in 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 these rooms a couple times, and I, I I wanted to thank him for my discussion or the conversation we had about about Spartan Delta here about three months ago. As of today, I'm up almost 70% on that in the span of three months. So thank you for that. Um, what I wanted to do oh, was... Oh, tough, 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 tough. Pro tip, pro tip. You got to keep quiet about your wins because the trading gods will come and strike you down, all right? So just keep it keep it down, all right? Like, just nobody... It's, it's, it's not... It really... Seriously, I know when I start feeling good about something... I want a showboat. It's like I'm about to get slammed. So I'm teasing you, man. Congratulations on that. Go ahead. Okay. So anyway, what I wanted what I wanted to mention because I know when I came back from that meeting the other night there, and I got come into the room and it was quite late at night, and the guys were asking me about everything that happened that night, and I had forgot to mention what Eric said about the NRGI his fund there on how he was able to get the returns that, and I think you heard him talk about that when he's doing the covered calls and. And stuff like that. I'm I'm not a, I don't do the the call game. So I you know I just wanted to let Oil God and them know if it comes up in conversation. Now we know what what he was talking about because, you know that's that's how he plans on making those big returns. Thank thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. All right, let's go on to Warren and then and then Denver and then Shrub. Hey, Warren, what's up? Hey, man. Thanks very much for uh, having this and hosting this and having Eric there, giving more of a platform for the Canadian oil mafia. First, I just want to say. Thank you, everybody, for ha- allowing me to be a small cog in the Canadian oil mafia. We've got a whole bunch of groups over on Facebook uh, that help people share information about the Canadian uh, oil and gas stocks that are out there. And, I, and, and I'm just so excited and so happy that there's 
so much more information being provided and, and a place where we can share ideas to the little guy. And it's not just the big industrial players with, you know, uh, hundreds and millions of shares that are able to um, uh, work in this uh, literally, and I'll take some of Eric's words, generational opportunity that we have going on. Um, you know, I, I just look back at where production is, where demand is, where the Canadian exchange rate is, because that's that's something that's I don't think talked about enough. Um, you know, the 25% bonus that we're getting because the Canadian dollar, even with oil at $107 US, is still at 25%. That's unheard of. And, and that's a, 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 an extra bonus that being in Canada, we're getting that I think is going to bring people into Canadian names that is going to be um, uh, such an extra plus that the U.S. names don't have. Uh, I, I think it's just it, it, it's going to be one of the key factors into why these Canadian oil names can still double. Well said. Like it's, uh, you know, we, we always got to check, uh, check our enthusiasm because... You know, and I was talking about to, to oil god about this this morning. One, I'm kind of curious what you think about this. You know, oil god, when now we're talking about, gee, it looks everything looks like it's going right, and we all want to get enthusiastic. And you know, I'm a guy. I always, whenever I find myself in a situation, it looks like nothing can go wrong. I feel like <laughs> I'm missing something. Exactly, and and and, 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 and so, and I see Marcellus is up here too. We're gonna get to him in a second as well. So. When you think about so let, let's argue the null hypothesis, okay? Let's not get into the mutual admiration society, you know, long live the Canadian oil mafia, yada, yada, yada. We, we're all here, okay? Right. So, so, Warren, when you stop yourself, you say, wait a second, this can't be happening or this won't continue. Like, when you try to argue against yourself, like, what's the best you can come up with, Warren? The best I can come up with, and that's where I'm going on a regular basis with people I talk to, because all of these events are happening at the same time. The confluence of events is incredible. So I'm going, okay, what is going to derail this? The only thing that I can see that is going to derail this is um, uh, once the companies get to a point where they're completely debt-free, that they're going to go off script and start doing drill baby drill again. Even with people like Eric saying, we don't want this. Share prices are going to be high enough. Debt levels are going to be low enough. The banks aren't going to be involved anymore. And that's the big thing I'm worried about. But I think that's a minimum of 18 to 24 months away, minimum. Plus, you are going to have the human capital issue, roughnecks who were in the industry for 20 and 30 years that have left the industry to find either to retire or to find other work and getting a roughneck who's experienced back in the field is not the same as hiring a waiter or a waitress. Those are very, very specialized technical people. And I think that's going to be a massive problem that even if they want to drill baby drill, they're not going to have the ability to do it. Yeah. And you know, it, 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 that's an excellent point. In fact, Someone tweeted it out earlier, and I retweeted it. They were it was you can look at my Twitter thread, um, the feed. There was a, a put a tweet out today about I think it was some of the American energy companies down in Texas where they'd gotten rid of like seventy percent, seven zero, seventy percent of their headcount in the last few years. And to your point, like you can't turn that around on a dime. So no, I think it's an excellent point. The other thing, I just listening to you speak, Warren. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. You think in other sectors where they haven't had the existential crisis that the energy companies have had, and they've gone for the you know, shareholder maximization route. So what do they do? They buy back stock. They borrow money to buy back stock. They financially optimize their model. And in many cases, it's not about growth. It's just, let's just maximize value for shareholders. So... Applying that, looking at it through that lens, a more gen general lens, not just the energy lens, and say, okay, what if these guys do like all these other industries do? They don't care about growing production. They just want to maximize shareholder value, which is kind of what they're doing. If this thing keeps going, oh my God. Oh my God. Um, and 
So I don't know. It sure. You, 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 let's put it this way: this industry's shown an, an incredible ability to screw things up, but I think they've gotten whacked over the head so many times. That, George, can I also time, add one more? Yeah, go for it. Let me add for one it. more. I just want to add one more thing. I just also want to tell Warren: uh, you're more than welcome. Canadian oil mafia continues to grow, and it's for people like you. So really do appreciate you. Uh, obviously giving the chance to the space and, and to obviously learning and, and giving that what you call education to the masses because this is really what it's all about. And so, George, I thank you for the space as well. Um, but what I'm going to say too is you need to think of the incentives, right? Because all of these industries that you know are competing with the dollars for oil and gas, like technology is an example, are in growth mode. And from a political perspective, from a financial perspective, from an ESG climate change perspective, this is not an industry that's set to grow. And so you do not want to be the first CEO to necessarily take that drill, baby, drill mentality. And so I, I appreciate that recession is an issue. One of the, one of the things that I certainly am going to be leaning on, and, I, and George, perhaps the Fidelity folks, the analysts in the past can talk to us about investments that become debt free and, and how insulated the stocks may be from price volatility in the future if they're just producing free cash flow. That's what I'm banking on, right? I'm banking on the fact that OPEC has no, uh, you know, they don't have much what you call incentive to increase their own production. Um, you know, the North American producers don't have much incentive, at least here in Canada. Uh, of course, in the United States, you know, when you have... Hey, oil, declines oil, 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 oil. Different. Go for it. Well, you got you got some noise in the background. There. I don't know what that all that is. We're having a hard time hearing you. No, that. so I believe uh, Warren. Can you mute yourself if you don't mind? Yeah, Warren. Yeah, okay, that's great. No, yeah, so, 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 just listening to you talk, it's sort of like you're channeling your inner Charlie Munger. You know, where he famously says, "You show me, you show me incentives, and I'll show you the outcome." And you very exactly you cogently laid it out. Everyone at the table, from a game theory perspective. Has no incentive to grow production. None. Zero. Abs abs and in fact, in fact now they have no incentive. Now they have no incentives. They got the freaking woke ESG crowd with pitchforks out after them. Don't you dare put another hole in the ground. So, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. No, exactly. Right. So, so one of the things that Eric had talked about this morning, which I think is exceedingly under understood, especially from a pricing perspective on these names. You're going into a rising interest rate market. And when you're in a rising interest rate market, people have not experienced a higher cost of, of capital literally in a decade, uh, you know, in two decades in some cases. These would be traders who put, you know, I'm a day trader, follow me this, max gamma, info sigma, all these things on Twitter, getting people to follow them in and out of trades. Well, it's easy to do it when the cost of capital is little and obviously trades are going to swing. But when society, let alone the stock market, gets more expensive, you are going to be so freaking selective of where you put your next dollar. And what Eric said to me that I think is the most important thing on the call is the fact that there are names in Canada that could be debt-free in six months, let alone two years. Six months, let alone two years. So if the cost for these producers is 45 to 50 to 60 in some cases to break even, of course, we know the smaller ones are the 80 to 90 to 100. Then really all you have to know is the ones that are on the, the former, that, you know, call them the larger caps, the more integrated ones, you know, it's going to be very, very tough for them to have a bad year because oil will fluctuate. But if there's not enough supply coming online, really, what is the new definition of a bad day for an oil company with no 100 percent oil guy, 100 percent. All right. So hold on. Before we go to the next speaker, I would just like to remind everyone, um, you know, these rooms are free and there are people in need, the people in Ukraine and World Central Kitchens is our designated charity. Uh, we put a so he put it up in the nest. Uh, please give generously to um, World Central Kitchens. We're all very fortunate here trying to figure out how to uh, maintain or increase our, uh, our wealth. There are people really in need, you know, they, they, they need our help. I do this for no personal gain. We really create something unique and powerful. I believe we have the best content, period, on the Internet, not just Twitter, Internet. I mean, where else can you hear speakers of caliber of Eric Nuttall? And the hits keep on coming. Tomorrow we're going to have Marty Fritzen, who is one of the leading experts on credit, um, for all us dumb equity guys, I'm talking about myself mostly, um, who need to know more about credit, why is credit important. 
uh, Marty Fritz will be in conversation with um, Bobby Justice, um, and, uh, Bobby J, Bob Justice. We tweeted out today, Marty's written a book, which you all can have a look at if you want. But if you want to know about credit, listen to Marty. So again, I, I ask you, please, please, please give to World Central Kitchen. The, the people really need our help. Okay, so we're now going to go to, I want to go, I'm going to take it out of order here a little bit just because we want to get all the oil guys in here. I want to do Marcellus and then Shrub and then Hector. Hey, Marcellus, what's up, man? Please unmute yourself. So, how's it going, guys? I uh, apologize. I kind of dropped in a little late today, but I did just post something up in the nest that uh, our buddy uh, Alexander Stayhill uh, had put out today. And I think it, you know it's one of the things that tells the story. I, I'm not going to talk about tickers. I'm not going to talk about U.S. or Canada. I'm just going to talk about the macro. Um you know, and if all I need to do is I just I just need to see continue to see draws and I need to continue continue to see, um, you know, graphs like that where drilled on completed wells are at an all time low for as long as they've been, uh, you know, keeping track of how many there are. Uh, that tells the story. If we continue to draw and ducks continue to draw, then we are not going to see an uptick in, in uh, supply. So. You know, I don't want to have a whole lot of, um, you know, wisdom to, to talk about today other than just keep your eye on, on the basic, you know, the, the basic numbers that we need to see to continue to see drawdown, um, you know, and, and that, that will basically show you the path, I guess, is how I would put it. Thanks, Marcel. I think, we, I mean, Marcel, you and I look at the world pretty similarly. I think we're, you know, I don't want to say unfortunately, because I keep trying to complicate things and argue against myself, but. I think we're kind of coming to the same ineluctable conclusion. Thanks for that. All right, so we're going to go to Shrub and then Hector. Hey, Shrub, what's up, man? Hey, George. I'm good, man. I'm good. Um, great discussion with uh, with Eric. Uh, and just one comment. The reason why I have a lot of respect for Eric uh, and for others uh, in FinTwit is when I saw him tweet a fo- um, have a photo of Sa- uh, Sohib and him, and I just respected him for spending time with Sohib and the other guys here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it just comes from a good place that he's done that. So well done to him and for spending time with us, of course. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is I just posted a couple of things, uh, in there about, uh, the oil services industry, which I'm getting exceedingly bullish. Um, but, uh, to your comment, if 40% of, uh, the workforce that worked in the oil and gas industry is gone since 2014. So that's the first thing. So there's been a 40% drop in people working in the US EMP industry since 2014, Uh, but also in the offshore rigs, and I used Valaris as an example there, but uh, offshore rigs are down 40% since 2014. And back in 2014, rates were at 500,000 a day, and now they're about 300,000 a day. So you haven't even seen the pickup in the offshore activity. And I think as someone very nicely phrased it is, these companies have been so traumatized that no one is really, you know, they're just starting to commit to, uh, to offshore projects because half the reserves of the majors are offshore. So you would have expected in a strong oil market, you would have expected a massive pickup in offshore activity. And, it's, and it took one year of, of high prices to just starting to pick up. So you, you can tell that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of scared <laughs> to commit large, uh, uh, you know, large amount of capex. Uh, so that's the first point. The second point is just going to draw people to a, a Vermilion made an, made an acquisition of a small Canadian company. So it's a 300, 3 billion company making an offer for a 500 million company. The stock was off by 20% at some point. So this is a company that's producing free cash flow yields of, say, you know, 30 to 50%. And they're going out to buy a smaller competitor to replenish their reserves, and the stock gets hammered. And I was thinking about this, um, you know, more philosophically, that we are bullish oil, we're getting excited, so the companies we're invested in were punishing them for also being excited and buying, you know, high cash flow producing assets. So the fact that the acquirer was down so much, it tells me that people are still not 
willing to pay up for even cheap growth. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's just my comment on this, that, you know, we're, we're not, a, this is not what happens at the peak of the market. Um, and then the third point, uh, and I'm done, people rely too much on sentiment indicators, which I really, really hate. So I keep seeing people saying, oh, everyone is bearish tech and oh, everyone is bullish commodities. And then you have a day like today, you know, oil was just going up. Uh, all the oil names were just steadily going up and then tech was trading like a complete piece of shit. So, uh, you know, just, just telling people, ignore these sentiment indicators and look what real money is doing and real money is trying to get out of tech. Every pop is getting sold. And on the other side, people are just steadily accumulating energy. It's like, you know, the, it's like really basic stuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's shrub. You and I look at the world similarly. It's just remarkable. Like, it looks so obvious to us and, and probably to many people in this room. But this variant perception and you know, the idea when you, you look at the world a little bit differently from everybody else, you sit there and you say to yourself, it's like, what am I missing? It's like, this is like so freaking obvious. I, I just, <laughs> but to your point, it, it's not about, there's a great quote from uh, Walter Diemer. It's not when everyone turns bearish that's important. It's when they're done selling. Absolutely. And, and Shrub, I know you didn't have the data the other day, but it came out. I want you to talk about the flows. I think there was a $13 billion outflow from equities. So talk about the flows. And then also there's some talk about, well, maybe it's because, you know, selling to pay taxes, blah, blah, blah. But. I mean, I mean, if this if this is a harbinger of things to come, this could this could, this could start to get real interesting. So, what's your perspective on the flow data? And by the way, I did know where equities, equity, energy actually got inflows, but equities generally had like a thirteen or fourteen billion dollar outflow. So, give us your weekly perspective on flows, my friend. Yeah. So, look. Um, so, even if thirteen billion outflows, well, you had about one hundred and sixty billion total for the year, year to date, and uh, more than that last year. And this is just two years. So we're talking about record. And I'll repeat uh, what I said at your last spaces. So the, the, the Bank of America survey came out and said that people are the most, so investors representing a trillion dollar of AUM was the most bearish on the economy ever, including Lehman. 72% thought the economy was going to get worse. Yet their equity positioning was... It's pretty normal, <laughs> if, if not slightly above average. So, again, to the sentiment versus reality, these people, and, and you know, the, the guy, uh, Michael Hartnett, who's a, he's a great guy and uh, a veteran, he was saying, I don't understand this. He's just like, I don't get it. These people are just setting up for a disaster. They're bearish and they're invested. Their equity allocation is, you know, above normal. <laughs> they're super bearish. So, to Walter Deem, so so that's the first point. The second point is when people refer to record energy inflows or record uh, commodity inflows. So the biggest inflow week I've seen in materials uh, this year was about five billion. I mean, five billion is a normal uh, week for tech. So uh, again, what we're long is a small. Uh, it's a small part of the index, and we keep forgetting it because we hang out with each other. So we think that everyone is long these things, but actually that's only 5% of the index. <laughs> and the other, and everyone else that I know is, is long the other 50, is long the 50% of the index. So if you're long the 5% of the index and short the 50% of the index that everyone's in, you have a, you have a pretty long uh, runway before things adjust. Yeah. So Shrub, do you think, uh, the, 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 I mean, sure speculation on your point, but do you give much credit to this notion that some of the outflows we saw this week were just because of to pay taxes, or do you think this could be a, a harbinger of things to come? This could be the tip of the iceberg. Unmute yourself, please. So, yeah. What wh What did Walter Deemer say again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and by also. The way, you know, you know, yeah, sorry, and, go ahead. Go ahead. And also, it's, a, it's always a reinforcing uh, process. Okay, so they sold be, be, because they had to, but then they get more margin calls and, you know, the levered guy wakes up a bit. 
uh, and uh, you know, I, I was with a friend a couple of days ago, and, and he has a real business. He has he's wealthy, uh, but has a real business. And he told me, you know, I checked my uh, I checked my account with the, with the bank, and they gave they gave back three years of gains in my portfolio. And I don't know what the hell to do. And by the way, Shrub, you just touched on something which I've been thinking about. And people know I'm half crazy as it is. So I have a lot of sick thoughts in my head that I don't share with you guys. I only I only let them out when it's gotten to half-baked. But on the one hand, as Albert Support has said in this room, over the weekend, bull markets don't die quickly. There's a learned behavior over the years. It's like going back to that old girlfriend again. People just want to keep running the same play over and over and over again. It's that Pavlovian reflex response. So it'll take a while, maybe, to wear to wear that wear that wear wear that scent, wear that energy or that sentiment out. On the other hand, on the other hand, when you stop and consider the lack of price discovery on these inflows that really was supply and demand has nothing to do with valuation. There's no price discovery. Once the, once that price insensitive buyer goes away, the real bid is one of price sensitivity where there's price discovery. So think about like when you have an IPO. Yeah, Marcellus, you can weigh in on this in a second too. Think of like a really hot IPO. You know, Coinbase comes public. The reference price is 250 or whatever it was. And indication is 270, 290, 300. I think it traded to 450 the first day or two. Because people have to own it. They want to own it. They need to own it. It's got no, There's no price discovery. It's got nothing to do with valuation. But once that last sucker gets filled... And then you say, okay, all the price insensitive buyers are gone. Where's the bid? And that's true in individual stocks. It's true for the market. And so you've had this, these, these flows. Michael Green's always talking about them. He's been right. But I'll tell you one thing about my good friend Michael Green. He ain't going to get you out. He's a fully invested bear. You, know, you look at his product. He owns the futures or whatever. And he's, he owns some put options against it. He's not going to get you out. Um, so you know, what's it going to take for this price insensitive buyer to stop? I think it'll be what always stops them. It's price. They're just chasing momentum. That's all it is. As Helene Meisler, a uh, wonderful technician, she works for uh, Real Money. She used to work for the beloved uh, Justin Mamis who passed away. She has a great saying, sentiment follows price. We see it at Fidelity all the time. Everyone chases. Everyone gets FOMO. We all get FOMO. I get FOMO. Shrub, you get FOMO. Marcellus gets FOMO. We all get FOMO. We're all human. But this has now been done with trillions of dollars. And so what I'm going to say, and I hesitate to say this because people are going to say, you know, Julian, you said the market was going to crash. It only went down 20%, so you were wrong. I think the chance of an outsized dislocation is much bigger than people anticipate or imagine that we, we, there's been no price discovery in the, in this, in, in, in this relentless move up. So we'll see. I mean, I personally hope it doesn't happen like that for a lot of reasons. So I want people to get killed, but also I want this to last a long time. I don't want it to be over so quickly. It's kind of like sex. Well, God, you, you agree with that? I thought, thought well, God, you, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, don't, don't make me a participant in this filth, George. I'm in the bench <laughs> press. I'm listening to this. Cannot believe you dragged me. I'm a family man, George. <laughs> forced participation. Who was it said the other day? I can't remember this room. Someone said there's going to be forced participation. And I turned in, yeah, and they're going to love it. They're going to enjoy it. Anyway, all right, let's move on. Let's, My let's, goodness, let's, let's happy go. Easter to all of you. 
Maybe we should do this only late at night. You know, it's been suggested I'm sort of the Howard Stern of Bintwit, so I've got to live up to that reputation. All right, so so let's go to Jeffrey and then Joe Monday. Jeffrey, what's up? Yes, guys, thank you for doing this. I just kind of jumped on a little bit late. I'm just curious, was it ever discussed uh, if these uh, oil companies are getting access to capital? Is it getting easier or is it is it the same? Has, has anyone gone over this? I appreciate it. Thank you. We didn't really talk. I mean, well, guy, maybe you want to weigh in or anybody else or Marcellus. Marcellus, why don't you take that? I mean, I, I, I don't think anybody wants the capital right now. They want to return the capital. They want more capital. So, I don't know, Marcellus or Oil God or, or so, hey, anyone want to answer that? I I'll mean, start with, yeah, I'll give it to Deep, but I, I'm going to say exactly the same thing that you did. Right now, the problem is free cash flow, what to do with it. Uh, but Deep, over to Yeah, I mean, I think specific to Canadian, I'm not talking about Permian. Uh, I think most of the, the small and mid caps that we deal with really don't want the, uh, to credit at this time because they, they had so much trouble with the banks over the last, you know, four to six years that they're, they're actively trying to extricate themselves from that process. Um, they're OK with with some of their, you know, their fixed rate notes. But when it comes to, you know, RBLs um, and, and direct bank uh, lending. They don't want it now. They're 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 shunning it specifically, purposely. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the the answer to that on the U.S. side of things because you know the market's so much larger in the United States. But I can tell you from the Canadian side of things, most of the names we're following are um, yeah, they don't want it at this point. Thanks for that, uh, Joe Monday, and then Hector. Joe, what's up? Hey, thanks, George. Um, so I just want to make a comment, uh, that people have probably heard me make before it's kind of gotten some mixed reviews, but I think, you know, with Eric sharing his time here today, we should probably, uh, bring it up. We have, uh, about 600 or so people on this call right now. I know lots more are going to listen to the replay. Uh, many are going to be from the States. Um, we didn't get into individual names really too much today. You know, and Eric did make the comment like, Hey, uh, if you like what I have to say, if you like the information I put out. Well, buy my fund or more importantly, buy my ETF. Um, for people in the U.S., uh, there actually is a U.S. option for you. And I thought it would just be it's in our best interest to maybe highlight that to kind of pay Eric back for his time and everything that he does. And so if you want to get exposure to the ETF NNRG, which is listed on the TSX, you can actually buy something in the U.S. called NNPEF. Um, the volume on it from my feedback sucks. People get turned off when they look at the ticker. But with my understanding of the way ETFs work is there's always a market maker there to make you whole. The market maker is just buying the listing here in Canada of NNRG. So you as a U.S. investor, you don't have to get tricky. You don't have to do anything silly um, as far as finding a specific broker where you can buy something on the TSX. You can actually just buy the ticker NNPEF. But again, the disclaimer is that uh, the feedback we've been given is that the volume sucks, but hey, volume begets volume, and maybe as this story gets out, um, that ticker will will become a bit more popular, and uh, and you can get exposure to Eric's fund, which is predominantly on the smaller cap side of things with lots of things that are not duly listed. Um, so I thought it'd just be good if we highlight that for Eric, so maybe he can get some volume up. Thanks. Thank you for that, Joe. And you're completely right. That was a very good explanation. Uh, do not at all be put off by the uh, low volume because all that happens is a broker, say, say, say Eric's fund is $45 a share or 45.05 or whatever. There'll be a broker that'll just, an intermediary who will just, if you go to buy the, the US ADR, they'll just buy the underlying Canadian and convert the currency and tack a couple pennies on and, and, and you'll be able to get it. So there will be, there'll be plenty of liquidity there. So I suspect you could buy quiet a lot of Eric's fund if you wanted to. Um, one thing I would like to point out, though, thank you for bringing up that we didn't really discuss much in the way of individual names. Now that Eric is gone, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And again, to be fair to Eric, I mean, we don't want to put him on the spot. He, he's so transparent. But I'm just going to read out here. And, 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 and if, if so, Abe, you want to throw this up on the nest, the link to uh, Eric's uh, uh, ETF. His top 10 holdings are in alphabetical order. Arc Resources, Baytex, Synovus, Crescent Point, Enterplus, 
Headwater, Meg, New Vista, Tamarack, Whitecap. My, my take on all this is it's a giant macro play. I don't have any faith in my ability to tell you whether Baytex is going to do better than Selgus, which is going to do better than Enterplus. So, you know, just buy them all or pick a few. I think it's a fool's errand to try to figure out which one's going to be the best. So I'm sure everyone in this room has their own particular favorite. But if anybody wants to ha have a – has, has anything wants to be any of those stocks as to why they really like one or the other, uh, free shot on goal. Uh, Eric's not here. Again, it's ARC, Baytex. Synovus, Crescent Point, Interplus, Headwater, Meg, New Vista, Tamarack, and Whitecap. Um, I do not want to get into tiny, tiny microcaps, which uh, with small floats that some people promote on Twitter. I don't think that's fair. Um, so Can I that add to that really quick, George? Go, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so his fund uh, on his page, you can get all of his holdings in alphabetical order. If you just go to Morningstar, you can get them in percentage order. And you can also get uh, on the same page. You can see whether he's increased or decreased his position over the last month. That's so and, uh, that's helpful, Joe. So, Joe, you say on the morning Morning Star actually has a, a bit more granularity. Is what you're saying? Yeah, because Eric's fund was actually started as a mutual fund in Canada, not an ETF. They have to, by law, disclose uh, their top ten holdings every month. Yes. So, Morning Star um, gives more detail than Eric Eric does on his own personal site. So it's typically just a couple more days delayed uh, from when Nine Point puts it on their site, uh, where Morningstar will have all their holdings, and then they just get they get a bit more granular um, as far as you know uh, what percentage he has in each holding and whether that percentage has gone up or gone down from the prior month. Um, and I would just like to say one last thing because I, I do think it's like I just like to pump Eric's tires and promote this as much as possible. Um, in in a previous life, I used to work with an ETF company, and we would launch ETFs all the time and they would have absolutely no volume and that was the hardest part we were in canada we don't have uh, deep capital markets and you bring a new ticker to a guy to be like listen this thing doesn't trade and i've had uh, multiple experiences of working with a market maker to get um a trade of you know 500 million dollars into a ticker that has no volume so etfs uh, do not let the volume dissuade you i just wanted to reinforce that point because i do think you know um as much as we can support Eric, uh, the better it is. And it's also better, I think, for an individual investor who doesn't have a lot of time or doesn't know these Canadian names as, as deeply as some of us might, that they can just let someone like Eric run it. They buy the, they buy their position today. If you listen to Eric, it's a generational opportunity. You don't want to sell this thing. You don't want to trade the wiggles. You just want to hold it for five years. Don't worry about it. You just buy this ETF and NPEF, and then you're good to go, and you can kind of just sit back and relax. So that's just like the last comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, that's great. Okay, so the order, we've got Hector and then Sean. What's up, Hector? Hey, George, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I was making notes as you guys were all talking because I was going to say something else that was about 20 minutes ago, but I'm going to move on. So first, George, thanks for doing these spaces. Thanks for bringing everyone's attention to the World Central Kitchen. I follow Jose Andres on Twitter and the stuff they're doing, uh, the videos they show of how they walk into a town that's been decimated, find in a restaurant and set it up and start making food for people. It's, it's amazing work. So thanks for supporting that cause, George. I actually, I was looking at it to donate and then, you know, kind of forgot about it and I was following him and then you started doing this thing. And I thought, yep, now's the time, jump in. And uh, so thanks for that. Um, I am a card carrying member of the Kane Oil Mafia. I own every single stock in Eric's fund, plus his fund and his new income fund as well. So I'm all over all the trade. Um, we talked about earlier, uh, we mentioned what could possibly a, a downside catalyst for, for this. Like, always look at the negative side if you can, because it's so positive. And uh, it's been most of the spaces I do are with people like me investing in this stuff, and we're all celebrating the success. And I've brought it up before, and I thought the end of the war will be a headline risk. The longer it drags out, I think the less of a risk it's becoming to for the dip, but I still think there will be a headline risk. But I wanted to ask you, George, your opinion on this, is when the war eventually comes to some conclusion, and I don't know how or when, um, there will be a little bit of downside, but it'll settle down. But do you think any way politically Europe or even Biden are going to be forced to say, okay, the war is over, let's buy something from Russia because the demand will be so big for energy and the replacement of the Russian energy isn't, isn't possible right now. 
How do you see that playing out? And let's just talk about downside. We always talk about the upside. What do you see the downside being here after the war is over? So let me understand the first question. The first question was, what is the likelihood of the U.S. buying energy from Russia once the whole thing is over? Well, not really. The, the, the Russia, maybe maybe uh, easing their policy to allow other countries to, to buy, like Europe especially, to buy some of uh, Russian energy after this is over. Because right now they're kind of saying, hey, we don't want anyone buying this stuff if we can help it. But I don't know if that's going to be sustainable when this is over. I'm just trying to think right. of what well, the... Yeah, well, so, George. So, so, Sorry, go ahead. Who, who's it? Yeah, so, go ahead. Yeah, sure, sorry, because sure, I have a strong view on this and actually doing the analysis a month ago helped me to stay on the trade when everyone was jumping out. So look, I did a very simple analysis when uh, when this came out. And, uh, you know, the simple analysis, you know, one of my philosophies is, you know, kiss, keep it simple, shrub. Um, so... Keep it simple, shrub! <laughs> 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 you like to be called Trump or stupid? Sorry. Go on. <laughs> same thing, man. Same thing. It's just good to remember that you can be both very easily. Go for so it. The, go for it. The yeah. simple analysis was: look at the countries that are under sanctions. Iran since 1979, Venezuela 2014, North Korea forever. So, Russia, what they've done is unforgivable but also it's too big to be ignored. So there is no chance on earth that the sanctions in Russia are going to f- are, are gonna stop when the war stops. It's just no chance because the presidents are there. So don't wait for any more significant dips. Every little dip, keep adding. Because I have I've an, I've a very, it's my number one position by far is Canadian oil. And I've been... Two weeks ago, my big thesis was as soon as the war ends, because I thought it was going to be a two, three week war, I'm going all in, like significantly more. And let's 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 lever up here. But that never happened. So I've been buying the dip slowly Yeah. Um, with this wait for this damn headline to come. And I feel like I shouldn't be waiting anymore. I, I mean, exactly. look, the, the, the dips are an opportunity in the sense if, if they're the wrong type of dips. So when I did the analysis on sanctions, it made me it, it gave me confidence that History is on my side that the sanctions are going to stay there. That's the first thing. The second dip was, so that was the first dip, actually. The second dip was the SPR release. And that one, I think by this point, we know that that was bullshit. So that was actually another easy dip. Um, I, I would, then you have the China lockdown dip. Again, that's temporary. We know that. I would be more concerned for oil for two, on two things. Is one is if we actually have a recession. A deep recession, uh, and then the second one is when uh, when they kill ESG. Because I actually told myself that I would get bearish on oil when ESG is dead. That's my simple way of looking at things, to be honest. Yeah, Shrub, I would just I would just add, and 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 uh, you know, the idea that oil could or might or should go down if there's an agreement on Russia. I actually think that's the hook. I think that I, I turn that around on its head. I think that's what's keeping a lot of people from buying it. I agree. I agree. And 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 you know, there's a there's a great manager up in Boston. He's kind of on the back nine of his career, Ken Hebner. And he's a very aggressive uh, kind of inv- investor, but he's, he's old school, not just value. He'll buy gross stuff as well. But he was always drawn to volatile things. And he would say, Oh, I love the volatility. It's the volatility that keeps all the assholes out. You know, everybody who wants stable things that are low vol, that are safe, they're afraid to buy. So this is good. This is good. So I think this idea that the oil price will go down, yeah, it might go down for a few days. I mean, is is so front and center in the minds of people who don't have the trade on. That's what's keeping them away. And I think in the same way, go back to Shrub's point about the SPR. I mean, we spoke about this a few weeks ago and it went down. We spoke about it in this very room. <laughs> what happens when oil goes about, uh, back up after the SPR is done? Now what? So I think these dips the Trump's talking about, this has the effect of de-risking the trade. It makes me more confident. So I think everyone's looking at the same risk that you're looking at. Say, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Forget about the fact oil went to the moon before we had any of these extracurricular activities in the Ukraine. 
So I turned this argument around on its head. And I, 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 you know, listen, can this trade blow up? Of course it can blow up. How? I don't know. It's like something out of left field that none of us are thinking about. Just as, you know, you go back to first quarter of 2020 when the pandemic went down. Nobody ever had any idea that was coming. That wasn't anybody's forecast, but, you know, it made it all go to negative, whatever it did. So maybe something happens. I don't know. But given the way the cards, you can't ever say never. But given the cards that are on the table right now, I'm with Shrub. I I, I just think, I, 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 you know, it's, 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 I think it's the other way around. It's like, oh my God, what if this happens going to go down? I think it's the opposite. Like, what if it just keeps going up? Like, why won't it keep going up? I, I actually believe the oil price right now doesn't begin to reflect the idea that two or three million, you know, whatever barrels of, of Russian oil might disappear from the market. Doesn't begin to reflect that. So I would actually turn the whole thing around and say, no, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hey, Shrub, how am I doing? You're doing great. You're doing great, George. <laughs> that is so enlightening what you just said, that if the war ends, it removes the final barrier for the people who've missed out on this to jump in because they don't see another the downside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm so, in the uh, trade and I'm a little bit scared about it. Imagine how scared the people are who aren't in the trade. Yeah, exactly, I mean, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Fuck George, I, I wish I could buy you a drink, man. That, that well, is no, well, you know what? You know what? Make a donation to the World Central Kitchen. That's how you pay oh, me back. Everybody, good. everybody. I'm like like Ed Beal in the network. I want you to stand up, get your wallet out, and make a contribution to World Central Kitchen. All right, so enough of that nonsense. So now let me see. We got oh, so we're gonna do uh, hmm. we're gonna do Schmuckatelli and then Weimar and then the real Schmuckatelli, my friend. What's up? Yeah, thanks, George. Great space as always. Um, Shrub, I learned so much from you, and I'm in this case in total agreement with you, which only uh, reinforces my strong belief that these sanctions in Russia are gonna last ten years minimum. The humanitarian outrage stop, and stop, horrific. Stop! 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 Repeat that. Repeat that. At least 10 years. Say it again. At least 10, 10 years. years. The the crimes against humanity are horrific. There is just no way. There's just no way these sanctions get... In fact, Europe is now trying as hard as they can against their own desires to even start to sanction energy. And then this thing is really going to go vertical. So... Uh, that's the first thing. I also love your point, George. It's a fabulous point. I mean, remove the last vestige of any kind of doubt or uncertainty, and uh, that would have all the generalists pile in when there's no longer any uncertainty about this war. Um, that would be a great time to buy. I, I totally agree with you. Um, earlier, somebody uh, talked about cash flow, you know, or, or how they're going to get money. Yeah, this is why I'm in Canadian oil and only Canadian oil. They, their free cash flow is amazing in stark contrast to most of their American counterparts. They don't have a problem with money. Uh, in fact, they're paying off debt massively right now and buying back shares and doing all kinds of other shareholder friendly things. So um, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, Canadian oil companies getting money to fund whatever they want to do with it. And the, and the follow-on to that is they have just fabulous management. Uh, their management is just top-notch. And uh, I trust their management. And they are going to do – they're going to be great st stewards of capital. So, so th there's your uh, cash flow thing. And then, uh, you know, the last thing is, is that um, – and Eric Nuttall and the Canadian Oil Mafia – have been really good about putting this out. This is a long-term secular bull. This is a, a long-term trade. I've said it before, George, I'm a terrible trader. You know, when you trade in and out, you got to be right not once, but twice. You got to be right when you sell, and then you got to be right when you buy back in again. I'd rather just stay. This is a long-term secular bull. There are going to be corrections, sometimes even 10 or 20%. That's okay. Because the long-term macro thesis is intact. And as long as that's intact, why would you want to exit this trade? The dovetail to that is, yeah, I believe the biggest threat, if anyone's worried what could, what could hurt this trade, it's a recession. In my opinion, it's a recession. And so 
each individual has to figure out what their time frame is. Is it, is it three months? Is it six months? Is it a year? Is it 10 years? Is it five years? And then you have to approach it in that way. So that's all I wanted to add. Schmuck Telly, always love to hear from you. And I'm going to be reaching out to you and Longfall. We got to do a war room sometime. Uh, so either this coming weekend or the next week. Um, and for those of you that don't, don't follow Schmuck Telly, who has the best name in Twitter, uh, he and Longfall have, 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 are vets. We salute them for their service. And, you know, not that he pretends to know anything, but he has a much more informed view about these things than us laymen do. And he made the call with Lawfall. This is a couple of weeks before the invasion where, you know, all the Illuminati on FinTwit, the guys who are now, you know, armchair foreign relations experts have retired from their careers as armchair immunologists or ar- ar- armchair um, economists. All the geniuses were saying there'd be, there'd be no invasion. Well, Schmuckatelli and Longfall took the other side of that, and they were right. So when Schmuckatelli talks, I listen. So, Joe, I'll, re- I'll reach out to you. We, we need to do a room on the war. It's, it's long overdue. Before we go to uh, Weimar, um, well, God, do you have a quickie you want to, uh, you want to get in? Well, God, do you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, it's a quickie. And, you know, I know he's a little bit closer to your age and than ours, George, and he's long gone. But John D. Rockefeller, when he put our Ohio on the map, and entered into the production of oil and gas. It wasn't his first foray into the energy space. He owned the refiners and he gobbled up all the refiners and he consolidated an industry largely after the Civil War. And why he did it is because it was obviously a little bit less of a riskier trade. And so for those of you new in this room wondering what to purchase, you're hearing names from Baytex to Synovus to I don't know and should I give my money to Eric Nuttall? You know, obviously, the easy case is to give it to Eric Nuttall, fully support it. Full disclosure, I don't own a dime because I picked down my own stocks. But you, what you want to be doing with respect to safety is finding businesses that are integrated. Because when you have recession, it doesn't hit every part of the production and the supply chain and the transportation the same. And the integrated names tend to be the safer names as opposed to a pure oil, you know, energy and exploration company. Uh, you know, that, you know, can go up and, you know, what they say, live and die by the sword. So I just wanted to give a reference to Rockefeller, George, because I know you're probably friends with him. But uh, really, the integrated is a great way to play the safety within the trade. Back over to you. Thanks, oh God. And, and by the way, you know, if you know what you're doing in the industry and you're, 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 you're a high-ranking member of the Canadian Oil Mafia, by all means, have at it. Pick your own stocks. But for the layman here, you know, I think that's kind of a fool's errand. I think the real more important decision, it's not whether Meg outperforms Baytech, which outperforms Sonova, so they're all the way around. The real question is, do you want to be in the pool or out of the pool? And I, I can say with confidence, I think Eric Nuttall would probably do better than most of us in picking which of the best stocks. So the management fee, which is de minimis, you know, I don't know, it's a half a percent, one percent, whatever it is. It pales in, 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 in comparison to the uh, types of returns we're talking about here. So I think fixating on which which name to buy is akin to trying to rearrange the deck chairs in the Titanic. You know, just get in the pool, and if you can't be bothered with individual names, then just go ahead and buy this fund. I, I, I do own this fund. So, um, and I agree. Do want- Agreed. Agreed. So that's perfect. All right. So we're going to go. We're, we're getting on. We're coming up on two hours here. So I think we're kind of coming down the home stretch. I want to go to Weimar, my good friend Weimar. Please keep a brief Weimar um, because we're two hours in this room. I, I don't want to open up Pandora's box into a big 20-minute discussion about something. We're coming on the last question. So Weimar and then Gerard. Weimar, what's up, man? Hi, George. Well, how, how are you? Excellent. How are you doing? Um, well, I, I have um, uh, I had a lot of agreements with everyone. So, um but the, the thing is, the structural part about the sanction is absolutely right. Uh, that's exactly how I think of it when I look to the history and see uh, that we uh, went from an environment with little sanctions once uh, when the when, uh, United States became a dominant player. It beca- became gigantic. Uh, so uh, the, 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 prob- the problem is... And I think this, this is the opportunity for oil 
is the inefficiency that is caused. I've talked about it earlier, so I won't repeat it, but inefficiency, when you have to reshore all these kinds of things, these are, this, this means that um, this is, I think, bullish for oil. So, um, so these two things are bullish for oil. Uh, as long as ESG is there, it's like a pack. And if the pack breaks, you know, it, it puts so much pressure when, when, when the need is high and there's so little finance. So at a certain point, the, the pack will break. I call it the pack. You know, these, if these things break, then you get massive, you know, action. But on the shorter term, I think within a half year, we will get a, a strong, a strong uh, recession, really strong. I also want to just uh, this is a, this is this is, this is information mostly that institutionals would uh, understand. Um, we had a long time, but it's, I think important to know. Long time ago, we had a low spread, and as you know, a lot of banks didn't make much money with these low, you know, the, the flat curve for a long while. Yeah, so that there, of course, are products made to to jinx that, and now suddenly, um, interest uh, rates hikes were were um, announced, and now you see. You know, crazy uh, bond markets, but this 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 may it has to do with leveraged, uh, securitized spreads. Um, it could be that. Uh, I mean, let let's put it differently. There there might be a lot of things because of these accommodative policies that uh, you know people were creative trying to make products, and if certain if at a, you know, uh, uh, um, a market suddenly turns. These guys, you know, they they they're caught. Uh, they 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 come. They lose shirts. So so, I think this also means that we could see a uh, um, uh, recession. Anyways, we were before Corona entering in a recession. Then we had the period of Corona, which changed the economy of changed the, the market so much that it was really hard to tell wh which way it would go. It was nuts. And now we have a war and, and now we're in, in another kind of uh, mindset. But I think it's important now, especially to understand how the world was before Corona and the war and that that was already strong for oil. And um, if you, you have to also see this beauty contest, which, which one is the best investment if we get a, a recession and uh, everything is at, at uh, top line and, uh, and you're already positioned in oil. I think it's great. Uh, maybe we get a, a bit of uh, you know, ups and downs, but you know, it's like Schmuckdali said, it's, 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 a, it's a, long, a long game. You know? It's not, not for just uh, a couple of months. This is this is um, I think this is why what you would want now is not to trade on a day on a war, which is, you know, it's very hard to trade in wars. Um, most people will tell you that even uh, Jim Rogers will tell you. Um, so you you have to, I think, look to the way it was before the war and maybe even way before Corona, because these things, you know, ma made a mess out of things. And saw that there are already weaknesses and already inefficiencies, and that's these inefficiencies, uh, when even even when the sanctions stay and everything, um, I think when 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 we get out of war, uh, we might see people repositioning a lot, and and then I think that could be very interesting for all. That's what, what, what yeah. I no, the Weimar agree agree one hundred percent with what you said. A couple of comments I wanted to make. One, for those of you who were in the room a few weeks ago, when we had Dr. Jim Walker in the room. Uh, he's a terrific, terrific economist um, of Austrian school orientation. But nevertheless, I think he's wonderful. And he was talking about the ex-post as opposed to the ex-ante world economy. In other words, the, the world and the economy that we knew before 
and the world and the economy that we have after. And the full picture of the ex-post economy has not yet been revealed. We don't know what it will be, but it will not look like what we had before. I mean, yes, it will have strong oil. I agree with that because oil is life. That's an aside. But in terms of inflation, economic growth, unemployment, et cetera, in terms of trade, relative price, we don't know. And coming to your point on it, the reason I'm making this point is coming to on, on inflation, you are seeing uh, tremendous price increases in so many different areas of the economy. I happen to be with someone uh, over the weekend uh, who owns a private company. The name is unimportant, but you know the name of the company. It's a uh, rather significant consumer goods manufacturing company. Um, and it's a type of product which, when the pandemic came, demand went up sharply, um, similar to fire pits for homes or barbecue grills or this sort of thing. So money was handed out in the form of these big stimulus checks. People stayed home. They didn't go out. There was a huge shift in consumption from services to goods. And they bought a lot of this rubbish. Well, there aren't too many people who left who need to own this rubbish anymore because everyone went out and bought it. And at the same time, making this product, the cost of it's gone through the roof. It's typically sourced out of Southeast Asia, out of China, Southern China. So, um, you know, all types of costs have gone up. Commodities, labor, um, uh, logistics, shipping. And some of these costs, they're not going to come down. The, the increase is permanent. So if you talk about, you know, they had to increase their labor costs from $12 an hour to $20 an hour in the United States. This is inflationary. Um, yes, now we get a big recession. Price, some prices will come off. But as he explained, many fixed costs have been, have been increased and they're not going to come back down. So you combine higher fixed uh, cost structure with a lot of hoarding that's gone on, inventory accumulation, um, which is further pushing the demand right now. When we reach the end of it, and his opinion is it's going to be before the end of the year, we're going to have a recession uh, because, you know, uh, you look at like retail sales. I don't give you the exact figures, but we're interested in, you know, not in precision, uh, we're interested in actually not, not precision. You look at retail sales, which have been increasing, I think something like 7 or 8% year on year in the United States in nominal terms. If you look in real terms, it's like minus six or minus seven because uh, the prices go up so much. Um, Bobby J will be in this room tomorrow. He's a consultant to a major consumer goods company. The name is unimportant, but you know this company. And they were explaining how, yes, the retail sales are, 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 are up, but more the, the price increases have been so significant that in nominal terms, or say in real terms, they're actually going down. So you're, you're seeing real uh, income squeezed as prices go up. Uh, and so one or two things is going to happen. Either, well, first of all, the, the Fed continues to run a very stimulative policy, uh, which is why you see uh, many of the commodity prices continuing to go up. That's why you see gold going up. That's why you see oil going up. And the only way they're going to bring inflation under control, and they may not, is if Jerome Powell rediscovers his inner Paul Volcker which I find very unlikely. So I think we've got a situation here where oil prices and interest rates, oil prices and inflation will continue to go up until we have a recession. So I agree with you, uh, Weimar. My only question is, you know, is it three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now? You look back historically, and I'm going to tweet out a link to um, a great video put out by David Wu, who used to be one of the head foreign exchange guys at Merrill Lynch. And he chronicles very nicely throughout history the setups each time around the around the recession. How did it happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? So yes, we are going to get a recession. I just don't know if it's three months from now or nine months from now. So I really appreciate that, Weimar. Uh, so hold on. So, so Weimar, oh, if you have one one more answer, that's fine. Then we're going to go to Jeffrey. And then we're going to call it a day. Weimar, would you? Yeah, have to... I have a question about this uh, link you uh, were about to put up. Um, um, he probably mentioned that the 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 um, moment of recession um, related to the uh, inversion of the curve, or no, uh, no, no, close, no, 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 no. You know what it is? It's the stock market. 
It's the stock market decline. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. It's the stock market decline. So, yeah. So, anyway. All right, Jeffrey, last question, then we're going to close the room. Jeffrey? Yeah, I'm just going over my last question. Um, I understand the balance sheets of the Canadian stocks are great. And they're, you know, they're hesitant to borrow money, which, which I totally understand. But my kind of original idea is, you know, what goes against the thesis of Canadian oil or, or the oil bull thesis would be drill, drill, drill. So I was wondering, and George, maybe you could be the best person to answer this. Is there a way to figure out if, say, the American companies are tapping the capital markets to start drilling, you know, they need funding and they need more money to to do all the drilling. Is there any way of, of going over and, and, and trying to figure out if they are tapping the capital markets, borrowing money to to expand their drilling and, 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 and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, we just there's no service per se. I just think that those of us who watch the oil patch, I mean, you know, we follow this closely and you just look at the spending decisions that are being made by companies um, you know, analysts like uh, Mike Rothman from Cornerstone Analytics, who works you know with Oliver Parsons, who been here earlier, they have really good data on that in terms of you know spending decisions and when holes are being put in the ground. So yeah, we will we will have plenty of advance warning when that happens. So it's a good question, but I don't think it's something that we have to worry about right here, right now. All right, that's it. Two hours and fifteen minutes. Uh, thank you all. It was terrific. We had Eric Nuttall here. Tomorrow, we're going to have, again, Marty Fritzen with Bob Justice to discuss credit. Um, it's, re it's required. It's a required distribution. It's, it's like when you're in college. It's a distribution requirement. It's remedial education for dumb equity guys like me. You're all ordered to show up and, and, and learn about credit. You'll enjoy it. And, again, please, please, please give to World Central Kitchens. The link is up in the nest. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to be having these conversations. So, again, thank all of you. And tomorrow at 430, we'll have Marty Fritzen and Bob Justice. Thank you all. And good night. Take care. Bye-bye.